Hello, geeselings. This is a, a very fun episode. This is recorded with Richard Kimberly Heck, Ricky Heck of Brown University, and before that, Harvard, and before that, they got their PhD at MIT. And this is the third episode I've done with Ricky. Uh, the first is episode five. Uh, the second is number 17. And both of those were broadly on issues concerning the philosophy of sex, the philosophy of pornography, philosophy of sex and gender. And this is the third in this massive series. So I guess we'll probably have around five or six hours on these topics all put together. You don't have to listen to the first two to uh, to be able to enjoy or understand this one. Uh, but it's a it's a really it's a fun it's a phenomenal conversation. These are topics that uh, everybody is interested in in some way or another. Some things we talk about we talk about what what they have called the great blowjob debate. We talk about Foucault on sexuality, Kant on the ethics of sex, whose orgasms matter most in sex. Uh, it's it's not men. Uh, or or anybody necessarily for that matter. Uh, we talk about the phenomenology of gender, social jor social norms, and signaling your gender because uh, Ricky is gender queer and they wear makeup and earrings and uh, it's it's very fun to talk about it and it really changed the way that I think about these things. And then we talked a bit about at the end some of Ricky's hobbies, which include audio, woodworking, and Linux, none of which are are necessarily that related. But if you, if you like this episode, you might want to look at the prior two, which again are 5 and 17. And I should mention that Ricky and I just recorded a fourth episode because their primary and original interest in philosophy was uh, Frege and logic and philosophy of language, philosophy of math. And in particular, we did, we just, we just finished recording a three hour episode on essentially the letter, the, uh, the word, the, but uh, really uh, the reference relation, uh, which is very important in, in the philosophy of language. It's, I mean, there, there are tons of debates about it and changed, but roughly it's how a, a word in my head or that I speak or in the abstract sense, uh, pins a name, uh, refers or picks out this strange, furry, mischievous object on my desk right now. Anyway, uh, this is the introduction to that episode, if you couldn't tell already, and I hope that you enjoy it just as much as I enjoy talking to Ricky every time they're on the podcast. Something that I didn't impress you on the last time we talked was you had mentioned that you received a lot of blowback from your right wing detractors when they learned or learned about or discovered some of the things you'd been writing in the philosophy of sex and pornography. And I was wondering what sort of things people were saying uh, about your it was, work. So it was more... Um... It was really just this one. Uh, I got contacted by a. Um, so I so I was I was scheduled to do a um, kind of presentation on feminist pornography for this event at Brown that's called Sex Week. It's I can't remember the, the exact organization. It's like a one of these peer sex counseling organizations that sponsors it. And they um, put on a bunch of different events every year. And so I had volunteered, um, a student asked me to to give a kind of presentation on feminist pornography. And so I was going to show some some clips and some films and then lead a discussion of this kind of stuff. And so that was advertised, you know. And so I got contacted by a um, kind of right-wing uh 
I think it's called something like Campus Reform. I can't remember the name of it. This was a while ago. But it's it's like a, a kind of news thing uh, that's meant to uncover the horrors of, you know, lefties on American mm-hmm. campuses. And so they wanted to interview, sort of interview me uh, for this story that they were going to do about this. And, um, and uh you know, it ended. It ended up actually not being. I mean, so I I basically sent them a statement um, about it, and they more or less just reproduced the statement. So it wasn't that bad. Um, but the the um, <laughs> the people who were like the most worried about it were the university's communication people, because <laughs> they have to deal with these people like all the time, and mm-hmm. um, they were sort of you know I don't know kind of concerned about how it was going to play out, but. In the end, in fact, it got canceled because this was in March 2020 that it was supposed ah, to happen. I so I did an, I did one of these. I did this um, a year later, uh, though it was completely remote. Um, and um, and then they, they had Erica Lust come and give a, again, remotely give a lecture that year and stuff. So it's actually pretty, I mean, it, it draws a lot of controversy because they have events like um, a naked yoga thing and stuff like that i mean that art as they say that it's kind of designed to sort of demystify nudity and body issues and stuff like that so it 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 always gets you know some years ago i guess fox showed up and did a thing on it and were you know so it's it always draws controversy as you can imagine yeah is brown uh i get the sense that brown is a very I mean, at least among the Ivy Leagues, it's a very experimental sort of place. Does it often draw Uh, these? I mean, it's very, the students are very socially aware. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's probably, if, if people have stereotypes about Ivy League schools being kind of lefty, then then Brown's probably the school they're thinking about. It's very much like that. Um, and not, not necessarily in bad ways, though, though sometimes, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I do think sometimes things get a little over the top. Um, do you recall the spirit of the spe- of the piece for which they wanted your statement or interview? Um, you know, they were just sort of, I guess it was, their attitude was sort of like, oh my God, this professor is going to show porn to students. And I remember when I was first thinking about teaching this class, one of my colleagues said to me, um, you know, it's class on pornography. And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show pornography to the students and have them talk about it. And he said, oh, students are going to sign up because they'll be able to see pornography. And I said to him, look, they don't need to sign up for my class to see porn. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, this is, this particular colleague is in his seventies. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, I mean, it was, it was in a way kind of ridiculous, their attitude. It was like, oh, the students won't be able to see porn unless they go to this thing. It's like, you know, they've already seen plenty of porn, trust me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're trying to, and so, you know, it was just sort of silly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I the, the, the person who wrote to me was an undergraduate at a, a, a small Christian college and, you know, so I was trying to be nice to her um, and not just blow her off and stuff. She wasn't so nice to me in the end, but, um, yeah, so it goes. <laughs> yeah. The professor in the 70s, in his 70s that you mentioned, it reminds me of a, a professor I had when I was taking astrophysics uh, in undergrad. And he came in uh, one day and was really excited and wanted to tell us about something he just discovered. And he asked us if we knew about the Google <laughs> because it uh, was so yeah. amazing to him. Yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> anyway. So, okay. So that was the blowback. It wasn't as horrible right. as I, as I thought it might've been, but uh, there was a, a paper or a topic that you had written on and we also didn't get into it last time. Mm-hmm. And this was, the great blowjob debate. Uh, uh-huh. And I'm wondering, what yeah. is the nature of the, the great blowjob right. debate? So that's actually, a th- uh, it's, a, it's a compilation of things that I put together for the, for the class. Um, it, it doesn't involve, I actually have written a half a paper on this, but, um, but it's, so 
some years ago, there was a, I think this is how, I, now I'm trying to remember all this. So I think it was in 2005 at the Berlin uh, Porn Film Festival. Um, they they were showing a bunch of, you know, feminist pornography from that time. And they had a kind of panel discussion involving a bunch of women uh, directors, um, including um, Petra Joy, who's a kind of well-known feminist uh, pornographer, Erica Lust. Um, I can't remember the other people who were involved. Um, and, and sorry for cutting you off, but maybe since, okay. some pe- since some people haven't listened to the first or second installment, even though I'll, I'll be mentioning it in the mm-hmm. introduction, uh, feminist porn. How would you define feminist pornography? I think of it, of it so, as yeah. pornography that ascribes or gives more agency to women and portrays relationships, uh, sexual relationships. More, um, I, yeah, uh, equitably. I mean, so it, it's generally speaking, just you know, porn that's in some way or in some uh, you know trying to is informed by sort of feminist values in some way or other. I mean, it, it, it sometimes, oftentimes it, it, it kind of the earliest feminist porn, if you go back to the eighties, the um, it's, it tends to be much more focused on relationships and sex in the context of relationships and things like that. It's, you know, but nowadays it could be anything. I mean, it could be hardcore BDSM. It could be, you know, a, Tristan Termino's made her rough sex series of films that you know involve a lot of very rough sex, but it's done in a way that makes it clear that this is something these people want to be doing. It's the kind of sex that they enjoy, and that you know that sort of thing. Um, so, so they so they had this this um, this panel discussion, and a lot of the women. Uh, well, sorry. Um, some of the women in the audience at the at the film festival started um, asking these very aggressive questions to Erica Lust because she has bl- blowjobs uh, often in her films. Um, yeah. And in her first film, um, the film ends with uh, the guy ejaculating on the woman's face. She asks him to do this. Um, and so a lot, so some of the women in the audience were saying, you know, how can you claim to be a feminist? Uh, blowjobs are anti-feminist and having men come on women's faces is anti-feminist and stuff. And she responded by saying, uh, something along the lines of, um, I'm a feminist. I like blowjobs (laughs) put two and two together. Um, and they weren't very impressed, uh, with that response. So, after this thing is over, uh, Petra Joy, who's, I guess, probably more on this kind of uh, relationship-oriented, softer porn sort of side of feminist porn, wrote a post on her blog in which she said something along the lines of, um, if you want to show uh, men coming on women's faces, that's fine, but don't call it feminist. Um, and Erica Lust on her own blog then responded with like outrage, like, Mm -hmm. don't tell me like what kind of films I'm allowed to make. Don't tell me how to be a feminist, that kind of thing. And so it it was all in the, I mean, so there's this sort of longstanding thing, which I think maybe I mentioned in a previous discussion of people thinking that like certain kinds of sex acts count as feminist and other kinds of sex acts don't count as feminist. Like we can just sort of say, okay, uh, missionary position sex, is that okay or not? Right. Yeah. And, and her, yeah. her, 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 her last point is like, that's a stupid way to, mm-hmm. to try to say what feminist sex is. I mean, feminist sex is sex in which everyone's desires and interests are right. respected, and and you know that's her attitude. Which I think of it. Back, I think you know. I think of the fem- Even though I, I'm not as well versed in any sort of feminist literature as you are, I imagine that a key component of feminism is just freedom broadly and freedom to express so uh, yeah i mean so there is a big debate about this i mean between uh, it sometimes it's put as a debate over kind of third wave versus second wave feminists and so forth so there is this really big issue about the way in which um your own desires get shaped by the kind of culture that that you live in so i'll I'll just give you a kind of an anecdote about this so the first time i ever it's actually every time i have taught this kind of material i've had students come to me and they say 
things like, you know, I used to think that I like this, you know, so oftentimes what it is is sort of rough sex, and this is kind of coming from women. They'll say, you know, I used to think that I liked being choked or slapped or, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and then they say, but now I wonder, like, why do I, why do I like that? Like, where did I, where did I get that from? And they, they kind of get into a position where they, it's, they, they're not sure what to do with their own desires anymore because they're not sure they can kind of trust them. And it's a, I mean, that, that's a kind of microcosm of this much larger debate within no, that kind of feminism. You so know, if your about, enjoyment of a facial comes from a, a patriarchal structure like Pornhub, yeah, is it really right. a feminist desire yeah, or a freedom? Right. Okay. Yep. And, you know, and so, I mean, this is a very complicated debate. I mean, and the, it's something I really wish I had. I mean, I'm planning to write something about this at some point, but I, I haven't seen my way through this issue at all i mean it's it's very very difficult um mm -hmm. fortunately one of my colleagues uh, nomi arpali is probably the world's greatest expert on desire so um mm -hmm. i intend to talk to nomi a lot about oh, this at some point yeah um oh, okay she, she's written several books on desire i mean it's she's a moral psychologist um Oh, uh, I mean, moral psychology is what she does, and so she's, you know, she knows all about this sort of thing in the philosophy um, department. Yeah, okay. yeah. Hmm. Um, but it's, it's, uh, you know, I. So in the end, I mean, I don't, I don't think um, that. Uh, I mean, I think there's got to be some middle position here. I mean, that you know, you. So we we shouldn't just say look as long as someone's making a choice everything's okay because their choices could be shaped in various ways by the right i mean this goes back to marx at least right the notion of false consciousness um so you know mere so what people sometimes call choice feminism is just kind of shallow and weak but on the other hand um as as many people will point out it's it's not as if there's some state of nature that we can get back to where our desires will be kind of pure and un, un, unadulterated by any social factors i mean all of your desires are always going to be shaped by certain kinds of social factors and so yeah, so you don't want to just throw that out. Um, where I mean that, and in the, especially in seventies feminism, I and mean, you find many women saying, you know, only if we could only get back to a kind of pure state where you know, then then we'd all be lesbians, basically, um, is yeah. is their attitude. Um, and so you know, so I think somewhere in there there has to. I, I mean, I I don't know. My 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 gut feeling is that there's some notion of something like draws its reflective equilibrium that one can reach where you come to terms with the fact that these desires are shaped and you either choose to endorse them or you choose not to endorse them. Um, but I, I don't know when they early enough about this to say anything intelligent uh, along yeah. these lines. One thing you're, you're pointing at to me, which I find very challenging about doing philosophy is that in some way, uh, any topic is connected to a hundred other topics yeah. and yeah. then you have to get into free will. You have to get into Rawls or moral yeah. psychology and it's very hard to get to the, to build a position from the ground up. If you're not writing mm -hmm. something that's a hundred thousand pages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that one thing I very much appreciate about your work and, and speaking with you is how dedicated you are to the research aspect of philosophy not necessarily i mean not that you aren't a prolific author but that you do so much mm -hmm. reading as well which is really great thanks <laughs> i <laughs> often think of myself as not reading enough but um yeah it's you know but it, it I, I i've become really fascinated with this literature um mm -hmm. and spent you know it's, it's like every time i read a paper my reading list just grows longer because I've got four or five things that are coming out of the bibliography for that paper. And it gets a little depressing after a while, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, you know, you just have to accept that eventually you're, you're not going to be able to read everything. Um, it just yeah. isn't a way that's going to happen. So now when I look at the literature, there are names that I know like Nancy Bauer at Tufts or Ray Langdon mm -hmm. or, or Nagel. And 
I can identify with them or them with the analytic tradition, but there are mm-hmm. also lots of names that I don't know. So I don't know <clears throat> how to parse them in this divide, uh, assuming mm-hmm. for the moment that there is a divide. But how does do the two traditions, continental and analytic, treat issues in pornography differently? Um, so, I mean, I, I think a lot of work in um, sexuality studies generally is, I mean, Foucault's history of sexuality is just like a, 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 a turning point. I mean, it, it's, it's the ways that he introduces of thinking about sexuality are, are so profound um, that there really is kind of stuff that comes before Foucault and stuff that comes after Foucault. Well, maybe and, before we, we get ahead. into that question, could we talk about Foucault's sexuality? Because I don't know anything about him, but he's mm. a, a thinker that I would really uh, love to know more yeah, about. Yeah, you so know, so I, I've, I've, um, I've only become, I mean, it's only in the last decade or so that I've, I've become interested in this kind of thing. And, um, you know, I was kind of scared of reading Foucault because I, you know, I figured he was this continental guy and it's going to make no sense and, and so mm-hmm. forth. But actually, it's it's totally, kind of, you know, there there's a background to it. I mean, in Hegel and and Heidegger and stuff, you know, that kind of continental tradition that I don't know very much about. So there are parts of it that sort of fly over my head. But for the most part, it's it's totally comprehensible. I mean, it's it's not that hard to read and. I, I, um, you know, I, I really wish that I could excerpt part of it in some way to give to my students, but it, it's not the kind of thing you can just pick twenty pages out of and say, "Here, read this." Um, but I mean, he, he, you know, his, his, his. There are two things that I think the book is kind of most remembered for, in a way, and the first is that he is very much opposed to. Um, to a kind of classical, uh, what you might think of as liberal viewpoint about sex, that 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 the, the the main story about sex over the course of history is one of increasing, of decreasing repression and greater kind of liberalization and freedom and stuff like that. And he he's very much opposed to that um, kind of narrative about the history of sexuality. Um, rather, he sees. Um, I think in a way that's that was really prescient the um the kind of focus on se- sexuality uh that's emerged in kind of western cultures as itself a kind of form of repression in a way I don't think he put it that way but you often see um nowadays for example certain kinds of feminists talk about the ways in which women are obligated to kind of display their sexuality in a public way um, the way in which teenage girls are sexualized at an early age and things like that. So that's kind of in the in the ballpark of what what I think Foucault had in mind. That he he's he's just he's very interested in in the kind of um, way that social norms around sexuality are are shaped and promulgated, and the influence that those social norms have on our own kind of individual experience of our sexuality. So it's become quite common, for example, um, for people to say that the notion of homosexuality really gets invented in the late 19th century, that people before that, I mean, there, there were people who were attracted to people of their own gender and stuff like that, but but that people didn't kind of, there wasn't an identity of kind of being a homosexual in the, in the same way before then, that people were just... Uh, now I, my memory's kind of fogging up on this, but um, there's this famous line where Foucault says um, that uh, I think he's talking about like 16th century England or something. He says, you know, if, if if one man fucks another man in the butt or something, then the only thing he needs is a hangman. He doesn't need a therapist. Right? <laughs> and by 18th by 19th century England, he needs a therapist, right? Huh. Um, and so that the ad, the kind of attitude towards homosexuality has just been completely transformed from being a kind of criminal endeavor to being something like a personality defect. And now, I mean, of course, it's been transformed kind of yet again. And um, so that's the it's those sorts of social transformations that he's so interested in. And so he. Um, he, 
there, I, I like the way Gail Rubin puts this actually in her famous paper, Thinking Sex. She says, um, look, uh, people need food to survive, right? Um, so it's sort of basic biological basis for eating. You, know? That's, you need to eat to survive. But you're not going to understand the culinary traditions of it to Italy by looking at people's biology. Right. To, to do that, you have to look at like all these historical and social factors of her, how, you know, culinary traditions in England and Italy evolve and stuff. And that's Foucault's attitude about sex is that, look, sex, is, there's a kind of biological basis for this. Right. Hmm. But the meanings and kind of social norms and stuff that grow up around sexuality, you're never going to understand that by, by looking at evolution or any of the, you know, those might be factors, of course. People wouldn't have sex if we weren't, you know, di sexually dimorphic creatures and all that sort of thing. But, you know, the, the interesting stuff is in the, in the kind of social realm. And that's, that's the kind of reorientation that happens with Foucault. Um, you know, Freud is just not interested in that. I mean, there's a, there's another obvious revolution that happens with Freud's thinking about sexuality. But for him, everything is kind of inside your head. And Foucault's vision is just much more expansive uh, than that. That's actually what I was going to ask next, was whether <clears throat> Foucault is thinking in in line with the... Heideggerian, Sartre, Camus, continental tradition, or if he's more psychoanalytic, or if these things just can't really be divorced. So, um, so there is a kind of, um, I, 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 so I'm not, I should say, uh, my, my expertise is limited here, but, um, but I think he is kind of opposed to certain aspects of the psychoanalytic tradition. So if you, is, I think he, he would have seen um, people like, um, crap i just totally spaced uh this um there's a whole french i mean so he was french and there's a whole french psychoanalytic tradition um lacan, this lacan is, is the person i'm thinking of right so he, he he um i think he would have seen himself as in some opposition uh, to that i can't remember him mentioning lacan very much in the history of sexuality uh, but he would have i mean certainly been aware of it and um you know i i think i, I don't know to, i don't know to what extent he he thought of himself as responding directly to that um but he's certainly not as interested in those sorts of aspects of of it as say lacan is and uh, people like eric eric and and stuff so then getting back to the, the question that spawned all of this, the distinction between the treatment of sex and pornography uh, by continental philosophers and analytic philosophers, is it that analytic philosophers in general are looking at this more from the uh, biological or scientific basis and continental philosophers are taking a more a social approach? I think in in the uh, my sense is that the the philosophy of sex literature is probably less um, less split along these okay. lines than say the philosophy of language literature is. Um, I think um, so. Bauer, for example, I mean, she wrote a, a very well known book on Simone de Beauvoir, um, and her own writings on this stuff are high are heavily heavily influenced by Beauvoir and. Um, and other, I mean, her, her advisor was Stanley Cavell, who's, you know, very much straddles the analytic continental divide. Um, and I think, uh, I think Martha Nussbaum is, is well, reasonably well informed about the European tradition here. Um, that's certainly true of, of people like Gail Rubin and you know, people coming at it more from the sexuality studies uh, angle. So my sense is that um, there's not, as I say, there's just, there's not as much of a divide um, on this. Though I do think that um, it's unfortunate that, uh, I mean, the other, oh, sorry, the other person, of course, to mention is Judith Butler, um, who's, you know, a, a big figure in gender, especially, um, who's heavily, heavily influenced by the continental tradition. Um, but um, 
it is it is kind of striking, and this is a kind of complaint that people often have about intellect philosophers that people don't seem to know the literature on sex. I mean, they kind of know the philosophical literature, but they don't seem to really know anything from sexuality studies or queer theory um, or you know, the film studies work on pornography or any of that stuff. I mean, it seems to be really just a kind of narrowness in the, in the way that philosophers go at this stuff. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate um, because there's, I'll tell you, I mean, a lot, when I read stuff on, on sort of sex and pornography, I'm mostly not reading the philosophical literature because I find much more inspiration in the, in the literature that's coming out of kind of sexuality studies and sociology and things like that. That was a, a you're again, anticipating another question I had is <clears throat> what is the difference or what are some of the different or what characterizes maybe some of the different approaches to sex and pornography? So what are you getting from an anthropologist, a sexual studies uh, professor, a philosopher, a sociologist, a biologist? There are all these different uh, attitudes or perspectives or approaches one can take to this topic. So one of the, so an example I think would be um, discussions about consent. So um, in the philosophical literature, I mean, so there's a very, help, very good philosophical literature on consent that isn't necessarily just about sexual consent. It can kind of take in things like medical consent and, and uh, consent to be searched by a police officer and, you know, things like that. So um, Wertheimer, Alan Wertheimer wrote a book on consent that's really, really, really good. Um, and so there's a lot of questions in the philosophical literature about you know, sort of these normative questions about whether this kind of, you know, what consent should look like and, you know, why consent is morally transformative in the ways that it, it supposedly is and so forth. And, and these are all interesting questions. Um, but I, but um, when you look at the, I think the thing that's really interesting to look at is the empirical literature and to look at like, how do people in practice go about asking for and receiving consent for sex like how how do how does it how do people do it when it actually goes well right and and badly for that matter right and that to me is like super interesting um because it's just much more um i mean oftentimes i think the complaints that you hear about theories of consent in the philosophical literature is that they they kind of look good but nobody, nobody has sex that way, right? No, nobody does that, and nobody's ever going to do that. So, mm-hmm. you you need a theory about consent that is is like manageable in practice for people. You can't give people like these standards that are just you know unmeetable, and uh, and so I think it's. You know, obviously, there are normative questions in the background. I mean, you don't want to just say, oh, well, here's how things actually are, and that's wonderful. But I think you can learn a lot about how, you know, about the nature of consent by looking at how, at, you know, you ask people, like, tell me about a time when consent discussions were good for you. You know, <laughs> tell mm-hmm. me what that looked like. And and I think you can learn a lot um, by, by, go, and- by looking at something like that. So what are some of the interesting things that have come out of the the empirical literature? So on the biggest one that of the most striking at? things is that um there's there's an there's an asymmetry between um consent and non consent. So when people um it's people are much more likely to use verbal methods when they're declining sex than they are when they're accepting sex. So when people are into sense. it, they they tend to give their consent non-verbally. And mm-hmm. so if you ask people like, how do you give consent? They'll say, well, I move closer to the person or I kiss them back or I touch them in a certain way. Yeah. The, the, fun, the funniest one, um, because I just never heard this term before, is what they call the butt lift. And that's when a woman is lying on her back and she raises her butt so that her partner can remove her <laughs> underwear. Right. And huh. so and women will say that's my my number one consent signal is the butt lift. Right. Huh. And and you can see why. Right. I mean, if you're if you're helping someone to remove your 
underwear, then that's a pretty good sign that you'd like them to remove your underwear, right? Now, mm -hmm. granted, it's not 100%, but nothing ever is. Um, and 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 uh, and so the other the other thing that I think is really really fascinating, um, and this is in a paper, uh, I remember I think this is in a paper by Frith and Kitzinger, um, is that people almost never say no when they're asked whether they want to have sex, and the reason they don't do that is because, as they put it, saying no in a direct way is not a normal social behavior under any circumstances. If somebody asks you, do you want to go to lunch with me? You don't just say no, right? You say, oh, I'd love to, but I have to do this. Or you say, oh, thank you so much for asking, but I'm busy, right? You, you, to say no would, and just leave it at that would be rude. And I mean, and it would be rude, right? And mm -hmm. so when people are asked if they want to have sex, they don't just say no. In fact, they never say no. I mean, almost never do people say no. They say, oh, it's so sweet of you to ask me. I'm so flattered or something, right? Mm -hmm. And and so in a certain sense, I mean, so Frith and Kitzinger in this paper, this is from 25 years ago almost, say that it's kind of ridiculous to have these, you know, consent-based sex ed programs where you're trying to tell women to say no because they they won't it's yeah. you're telling them to violate well-established social norms that it's extremely uncomfortable for anybody to violate so it's just kind of i mean so this has i mean obviously practical effects on the way you should be talking to people about consent but it also i think you know really informs philosophical accounts because the the you know many so many of the philosophical accounts kind of revolve around this question of saying no and there's a it, it's just it's the wrong terms in which to talk about it because people just don't do that and they're not going to and there are sort of very good social reasons for that and sort of what's what's most fascinating about this is to me in a way is that there's a there's a kind of natural um, response that it can be tempting to have, which is that if women are declining sex in these kind of indirect ways, like saying, "Oh, it's nice," you know, maybe another time, or "I'm not ready for that," or you know, whatever they might say, that this might be kind of it risks a kind of misunderstanding or something. But there are these other follow up studies that show that that's just not true. Um, men are perfectly capable of understanding what women are doing in these kinds of circumstances, whether whether it's a sexual situation or not a sexual situation. And so the kind of whole idea, which permeates a lot of the philosophical literature, that date rape in particular is a result of a kind of misunderstanding, is just empirically false. I mean, there's simply no evidence for that at all. It's a very common view. Um, it was a very, very common view in the in the 80s. It went under the name the, mis the miscommunication hypothesis, it was called. Um, and it's still uh, a pretty common view, I think, uh, among, you know, it's kind of the common wisdom, I think, often that men don't understand, you know, women aren't clear about what they want and men don't understand what women want. And there's this confusion and it ends up in, you know, a date rape. But that that's just that, I mean, I'm sure that happens every once in a while, but it's it's not a um, sound account of, of what most date rape looks like. And so I think in, in this particular case, I mean, I, I think there's, a, there's an entire philosophical discussion about about this kind of issue that is just wrong-headed because it's empirically refutable. And just wondering, if, so if date rape isn't attributable then to a misunderstanding, is it attributed then to uh, malevolence or selfishness or yeah, sociopathy? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, that's what, so, I mean, this is what, again, what Frith and, Frith and Kitzinger say is they say the, the problem is not that men don't understand women's sexual refusals, it's that they don't like them. Yeah, that makes um, sense. And it's that, you know, it's sort of that simple. I mean, yeah. and what, what's even more interesting in a way is that the men who do this will use the fact that it's the common wisdom that it happens to, to cover their own tracks, 
right? So they'll pretend that they didn't understand, even though they did, knowing that the culture, I mean, in effect, this is a pillar of rape culture, right? The fact that men can get away with this is attributed to the fact that this is what people think happens when it doesn't really happen. And, you know, so, and, and not only will men do this, but women, that the, 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 the craziest thing about this of all is that women will sometimes appeal to the very same myth to excuse the behavior of these men mm-hmm. that, you know, it's a, someone that they like and know, and they, you know, don't want to feel bad about that person or something. So they'll say, oh, you know, they'll kind of blame themselves and say, I, I you know, I should have spoken up or he, you know, I, I wasn't clear enough or whatever, when in fact they were perfectly clear. It's just, you know, the right. person didn't want to hear it. And they're, they're capitalizing, I suppose, also on the, just like it's very difficult to say no. It's also a huge social cost to, uh, report something as not being a misunderstanding yeah. but being date rape and when yeah. you know that it makes it easier for you to project that somebody will accept your oh this was just a misunderstanding excuse yeah and, and of course i mean it, it, given the pervasiveness of the myth it's going to infect any you know attempts to get justice as well because people mm-hmm. will be willing yes, yes. to to set it aside and uh, you know no, so it, it's a it's a whatever. very complicated thing right i mean with a lot of moving parts here um but all of which conspire to to put women at a at a mm-hmm. you know disadvantage would be understating the point yeah um and, and i think we might have touched uh, on this a bit in one of our last conversations but it's worth going into again so granted that this is extremely complex as you just mentioned with a ton of moving parts how do we bridge then this gap b- between what the empirical literature tells us about consent and then what might be referred to as the unsatisfactory philosophical expectations that we have for a model of consent as just being a this yes no dichotomy yeah i mean so i think i mean i i think that what i just actually just found this paper uh the other day this paper right here um which is called mutuality oh, and sexual out. yeah i i did print this one out cuz i wanted to make sure i remember to read it uh-huh. Um, but it's written by a woman named Sharon Lamb uh, and two other people. Um, and she is a, a psychologist uh, who's at UMass Boston, actually. Um, um, and it's a, it's, but it's published in a journal called Ethical Theory and Moral Practice. So it's a kind of philosophy journal. And there's a, one of the a philosophers, one of the co-authors. Um, but it's putting forward a kind of standard of, of ethical sex that involves what they call mutuality. Um, and one of the downsides to the way that people talk about consent, um, is that it's an inherently asymmetrical notion, right? So when you, when so when you consent, somebody's asking for consent and somebody's giving consent, um, it, it generally speaking seems to involve a kind of treatment of another person. So if, if you, what you consent to is being treated in a certain way, um, and that's, and while people pay lip service to the idea that both parties, so let's say it's two people, need to consent uh, for the sex to be okay, in practice, we all know who's doing the asking and who's doing the consenting, right? I mean, in a heterosexual context. And so the the whole consent thing, that kind of language just reproduces a, a, a power asymmetry between men and women in heterosexual relationships that the the woman is poised in the role of what people call the gatekeeper right she's she the the man is the one asking and the woman is the one either opening the gate or not opening the gate and that i mean i i'm convinced and i think a lot of people nowadays are convinced that that's just got to be the wrong way to think about this that you need uh we need a kind of understanding of what ethical sex looks like that involves something like two equal parties you know coming together to do this thing you know with one another in some deep way so is right? that and, and like, the big you, challenge go ahead i mean 
that's a normative claim i'm wondering is that a normative claim are you saying that that's what sex should be like or what it it is in practice because in practice it seems like that's not i mean in certain cultures it's certainly not the case but yeah so it's it's meant to be a claim about what ethical sex looks like okay um um so um Kant, I mean, so there's this really, I mean, for anyone who's who's kind of wanting something to read to get into this, um, let me recommend a paper by Barbara Herman, uh, who's a Kant scholar, uh, called Could It Be Worth Thinking About Kant on Sex and Marriage? Um, and Kant, uh, the, the, the paper is fascinating because she, she, She says at the beginning of the paper that she was taking, uh, she was involved at the time in a reading group of of various women on, on, I guess she was at Berkeley at the time, um, who were reading like Dworkin and McKinnon um, and, you know, various bits of feminist theory. And at the same time, she was, you know, as a Kant scholar and she's like reading Kant and she reads these parts of Kant and she's like, that sounds like McKinnon. And it, it does, it really does sound like McKinnon, because Kant, I mean, what's different in Kant is that he he doesn't see the gender thing that McKinnon sees. But Kant's vision of sex is that it involves one person using the body of another person for their own selfish ends, namely sexual gratification, which in the context of Kant's overall moral philosophy is 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 horrible right it's a terrible terrible thing to do it's like the worst thing you can do to somebody is to treat them as a mere tool of your own ends and that's how kant sees sex he sees sex as i mean he he doesn't he sees it as both people using the other person which doesn't make it better it just makes it twice as bad in kant's view in fact uh, you know if, if you think about the, the actual nature of sex in 17th century, say 18th century Germany or something, mm-hmm. it's probably more one person using another person. We know which mm-hmm. person is on each side, mm-hmm. right? And so that vi- that kind of picture of sex as kind of, as I, I, I borrow this from McKinnon, which I don't think she ever puts it quite this way, is that sex is something that men do to women and that women do for men. That vision of, of what heterosex looks like is just absolutely pervasive in, in our culture. And it's what, it's, it's, it's what it seems to me, and I think, again, to lots of people, most fundamentally has to be changed in order to, 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 to get to a place where where women aren't routinely being harmed by consensual sexual encounters. And it's so that it's that idea of trying to trying to articulate some notion of of mutuality or equality or something like that, um, that would be a kind of standard, obviously. Um, but and that, that sex in, in many parts of, of human history may never have met or even come close to meeting. Um, and and in many cases for social reasons. I mean, the 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 as you say. I mean, in in many parts of the world, even today, let alone in the past, it would have been almost unimaginable for people to think of sex in a different way um, from this highly asymmetrical thing. It's just, I mean, you just wouldn't have the the conceptual resources to think of it in any other way. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, obviously think of it in a different way. Now, going back to Kant for a moment, and <clears throat> this notion that, I mean, one of the worst things you can do is use another person as a tool, and in sex, uh, each person is using the other as a means to an end. Did he also have a normative claim about how sex should be and how it could be improved? Or to, so to he... borrow a, a, a term from like Christianity, did he think we're all just sort of like born in original sin and sex is destined to be just like this evil thing that we have to live with. So Kant has a theory about how marriage solves the problem. Um, uh, and so he wasn't a premarital sex fan. Yeah. So he thinks, he, he thinks that, that when, that he thinks that it's possible for there to be a kind of, in effect, the, the basic idea, I mean, I'm no Kant scholar, is that you can put it in a larger context of respect between the two parties. But in fact, what Kant ends up saying is that the two, the, 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 when, the, when two people are married, uh, 
they become one person so that there's never any real there's no longer really a question of one person's will overpowering the other person or anything because they they have their wills have become kind of unified now in fact what's happened is that the woman's legal status has been absorbed into the man i mean that's legally speaking that's what happened and so you know Kant's i mean i don't think anybody takes Kant's solution terribly seriously but um but but you often see this idea that 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 coming up in other contexts where where by the idea is that kind of yes in this particular moment i'm using you for my own purposes but but there's a kind of broader context of respect and mutuality and stuff like that that kind of excuses it or makes up for it or reveals it to be not quite what it seemed or or something like that. Um, you know, the ne the next paper after that is Martha Nussbaum's famous paper on objectification, um, where she she very much takes up this idea. I mean, in effect, what Kant is is saying is that in sex we objectify each other. And and there's something necessary he thinks about that that that's just how the nature of sex is such that we have to objectify one another, and so in that paper Nussbaum a goes on this lengthy conceptual explanation of uh, exploration about what is objectification anyway, and she distinguishes seven different kinds of objectification, um, and tries to understand the relationships between these seven different kinds. And then she goes on to argue, and I think what the paper is best known for, is that objectification is not always bad. Um, she thinks that there are ways in which we objectify one another sexually that are, as she says, wonderful um, and, and moving. Um, that it, it can be a wonderful experience to be treated as a, a sexual body, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, I think myself, uh, I, well, it's a totally different issue, but you know, I think men rarely have that experience. Um, and it's in, in my experience, it's quite rare and 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 one and indeed wonderful <laughs> when it does happen. Um, I think you know, for women, it's much more common and too common, and you know. But we seem to, this goes to Beauvoir, really. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, her idea is that men and women have made a deal that because it's so difficult to be a subject in the world that men will be the subjects and women will be the objects. And um, so I think Beauvoir is all over this kind of thing, too. Um, but Nussbaum, uh, you, you know, I, it, the, I think part of what's interesting in the paper is that, you know, she kind of, takes on board this, this kind of Kantian idea, but then gives it this interesting little twist of saying, you know, well, yes, he's, of course, you know, treating someone as a mere means is a problem, but there's a way in which there can be, there's, there's a kind of objectification anyway that, that isn't necessarily problematic. Well, this is slightly off topic, but I imagine that uh, on any account of performance art where objectifying another person and it's a positive thing uh anyway though before we move away from consent there was a paper with a nice title that i saw that i i thought you might have you might be able to explain to me and it was it's by rain reina gattuso and it's called oh, what reina i would have gattuso, said to yeah. you what i would have said to you last <laughs> night had yeah. you not come and then fallen asleep fallen asleep yeah <laughs> Yeah, so, so we what... read that one um, in connection with uh, another very famous, well, a very famous paper by Anne Kett uh, called The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm. It was published in 1970, I think. Um, That's a and, nice title, too. Yeah, it's so, and, and that, I mean, that paper is about the Freud, this Freudian idea that there, that women have, there are two kinds of orgasms that women can have. There are vaginal orgasms and clitoral orgasms, and clitoral orgasms are kind of immature and bad and vaginal orgasms are mature and good and kind of the one of the central developmental tasks of women is to abandon their infantile attachment to the clitoris and become yeah. well capable maybe of vaginal I, orgasms maybe i'm revealing so. some embarrassing lack of knowledge but are there two spe special types of orga orgasms do they break up that so way? women report lots of different i mean women report of course some women are capable of orgasming from intercourse alone that's that's really what freud is talking about um is that he he thinks that sort of a mature women's sexual 
a, a mature, a, a sexually mature woman should be able to orgasm from intercourse alone um, without any additional stimulation. And those are what Freud called vaginal orgasms. Now, I think most um, people nowadays would tell you that those orgasms result from clitoral stimulation just as other kinds of orgasms do. It's just less direct. And we also know now that the clitoris is a much, much larger structure than uh, has been was thought before. I mean, right. then what usually when people talk about the clitoris, visible. they just mean the 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 the, the bulb, what's called the bulb, but right? this tiny little thing. With this yeah, but it's really a horseshoe. Kind of looks like a um, uh, horse, a, a wishbone, um, right, surrounding the the, the vaginal canal. Um, so that there are actually, you know, so there's a lot of clitoral stimulation. It's just the clitoris is much larger. Um, and, you know, there are, some women uh, respond to stimulation of the anterior wall of the vagina and the so-called G-spot and so forth. So there seem to be lots of different, and I mean, some people um, can even orgasm with no physical stimulation at all. I mean, just as a, by kind of focusing their mind Tantric. in the right way. Yeah. So you know, orgasm is, I mean, actually there's a whole literature about what orgasm is and like, how should it be defined? And is it a physical thing? Is it a psychological thing? Is it a combination of those two things? Um, Foucault would jump in to tell us that how that's defined is a matter of social power uh, and interests of medical professionals and things like that figure into this. Um so it's, you know, there's there's probably no kind of, as it were, naked truth about what orgasm is, freed of social context. Um, that would be for Foucault's reminder to us. Um, so so that, pa that particular piece by um, Gattuso, um, who wrote, she, she's now, I think, working in India in development work, I think. I looked her up a little while ago. Really interesting person. Um, but she wrote that for the Harvard Crimson, or, or wrote it, uh, she was writing for the Harvard Crimson at the time. Um, and it's, it's basically about the way in which um, men's pleasure is... Uh, prioritized over women's pleasure in heterosex so that um it's it's almost and in fact if you ask people the question like when what when would you say that you had had sex what they will often say is when a man has an orgasm is what they'll say um as a result of intercourse they'll say something like that right that sex is complete when the man has had his orgasm and the whether the woman had an orgasm is just yeah you know neither here nor there um, it's got nothing to do with it. Um, and that's what Gattuso is going on about, um, is the idea that that men, I mean, I think there's another piece I, that I link somewhere off the syllabus um, in which this person, one woman complains and says something like, look, sex is like defined in terms of your pleasure. <laughs> She's you know, complaining to this man. You know, my pleasure doesn't, you know, seems to be this kind of optional thing that doesn't really have anything to do with it and you know and, and there's a lot of truth to that i think um it's it's i think even the even the most the best meaning uh, of men often can can uh lose sight of this um that that you know it's <clears throat> well i don't know maybe that's enough uh, uh for now on this Okay. Well, I'd like to shift gears slightly, not majorly yet, uh, but to questions of gender identity. <clears throat> and I think it's it might be on your website or on your page on Brown, but it says that recently you've been very interested in understanding the notion of gender identity that is the subjective experience of oneself mm -hmm. as a gendered person. And broadly, what have you been thinking about in that area? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that I wish I had more to say about. I mean, I, okay. I, I, I'm hoping that I, this is something I'm kind of, I was going to say groping towards, but in the present context, maybe that's not okay. a good, yeah, yeah, yeah. good word. Um, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Crawling towards. Um, but 
so most of the literature, if you look at most of the literature on gender in, in the analytic tradition, especially, so I'm thinking especially of Sally Hauslinger and um, and people in that tradition. And I should say, you know, I, I couldn't have more admiration for Sally's work. So I don't mean to couldn't have more, say oh, admiration. more. I could have. Yeah, I couldn't have more. I mean, I, I love it. Right. It's, it's fantastic work. It's you know, she's been an incredibly important person in fe analytic feminism. Um, so I'm not I don't want to say that it's bad to be focused on the thing that she's focused on. But what she and others have mostly been focused on is the sort of what you might think of as kind of the objective category as of gender. So what is what counts as a man? What counts as a woman, right? So how you know how could we give necessary and sufficient conditions? Not that we really think we can, but you know how what 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 is it to be a man or a woman in the kind of current social milieu or whatever? So and and Hauslinger has a definition that she gives of this, and other people criticize it and they add their own bits and stuff. Um, but but this this is what I think of as kind of what I'm calling the objective category. Right. So it's there's this class of people. And do you fit in that class of people or don't you fit in that class of people? And so that's one thing. But the thing that so, I mean, I'm I'm most I've gotten interested in this because of my own kind of complicated relationship to my own gender. And, you know, many years ago when I was sort of trying to figure this stuff out, I would say to people things like, you know, I don't feel like a man. And they would look at me like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, what is it to feel like a man? And you often see, you know, but if you read the bi biographies of trans women for all the autobiographies of trans women, so read Janet Mock's book, for example, um, you know, she'll say, you know, when I was younger, I just, I didn't feel like a boy. You know, I felt like a girl. And people will say, well, what on earth are you talking about? You know, what, is, what does that mean? You know, and, and often, yeah, yeah. you know, especially kind of uh, let's let's just call them trans skeptical people will say there's no such thing as feeling like a woman. You know, this is all bullshit. And but but there are certain there is something there, it seems to me. And certainly from my own experience, it, it feels that way, that there is something that I, that I in the in the in the, have to have tried to call something like the, the subjective experience of yourself as gendered. And I don't think, I don't think that that reduces to like self-categorization. I don't think it's a matter of kind of putting yourself in a certain box of, you know, thinking objectively that I belong in a certain box. It's something that's prior to that. And right, I, right. I really struggled to sort of give expression to this. But what I, you know, what I always come back to when I think about this is, is the notion of belonging. And so... So here's a kind of just anecdote about myself. Um, so, you know, when I was in, in elementary school, there would be lots of times when the class would get divided up into the boys and the girls, right? And I would be put with the boys. And of course, I knew, I understood why I was put with the boys, but I never felt like I belonged with the boys, like that's, that that was my home, you know? It's not that I, it's not that I necessarily felt that I should instead be with the girls, but it's like, but, you know, but, but in a way, neither, I mean, that's, that's who I am, right? I, neither of those two things felt like the right place for me to be. And did you have any it, characteristics that were particularly what we would consider as feminine? Um, or I, was it just I, this very prior sense of just belonging? Um, well, I mean, so, ineffable? you know, I, one of my one of my saddest memories, actually, of of my, I have very few memories of my childhood. I should I should say um, uh, there are lots of good reasons for that. Um, but one of my one of my most tragic memories of my childhood, I, I must have been six years old. I was in first grade, um, and I we were living in Winston Salem, North Carolina, where my parents live now. And I was going to Sherwood Forest Elementary School, and I had a friend whose name uh, was Libby. Uh, short for Elizabeth, and I went over to her house one day, um, and and uh, after school, I can't I can't remember why, but anyway, um, but I was fascinated by her dolls, um, and I you know, and we and I like got her to to show them to me and play with them with her and stuff, and her parents were horrified um, that 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 I would do this. 
Um, and I was never allowed to go to her house again oh, wow. um, because of this this you know interest that I had shown in dolls. Um, to How make it even worse, sorry, sorry. How old do you think you were? I was six years old. Oh my god! Yeah, I, yeah, I would I would have been six, maybe. I mean, yeah, I would have been six years old. I mean, so this was a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I, I. But there are plenty of people who would react that way today, and let's not forget that um, things mm -hmm. certainly have changed so that many people wouldn't react that way. But there are plenty of people who would react that way, mm -hmm. um, um, and. That you know, and I always had interests like that. So you know, when I was a when I was, but you a said child, to make things worse, like it was going to get worse. And oh yeah. I, so I you so up, we sorry. moved away when I was in second grade. We moved to Dallas, my family, and then in in when I was a, going into eighth grade, we moved back to North Carolina, um, and I went to uh, to 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 Wiley Junior High School in Winston Salem, North Carolina. And what do you know? But in that class is Libby, right? My my friend from first grade, who I remembered all these years. And what does Libby do but tell everyone in the class that I like to play with dolls? Mm -hmm. That's what she did. Um, that was welcome a to the new start. kid, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it just it it points up, you know. It, I'm sure many, you know, my story is not unique in any ways, let alone as bad as many other people's. But, you know, not not conforming to the gender norms has its price, even yeah. when you're six years old. Um, it's or, more or 12, painful you know? or in many ways, more painful since it's, you're so young, uh, not fully formed and you carry that with you. Yeah, and have no idea, you know, what, what is your what, what did I do wrong? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, as a child, I, I, I was very close to my mother. Um, I still am. I was born, my mother was 18 when I was born. So I was, you know, she was young, um, and still is <laughs> relatively given how old I am. Um, but you know, she taught me to sew. Um, I used to do macrame and uh, lots of kind of craft projects like that that would be more traditionally associated with girls than with boys. I also played sports and you know was reasonably athletic and and stuff like that. And I you know to, even today, I mean, I have you know more masculine kind of hobbies and also more in a way feminine kind of hobbies. Um, but that's you know I think as growing up, I you know I I I just was much. Again, it wasn't that I was kind of single-mindedly interested in the kind of things that the girls were interested in. Um, so I, I never, you know, I'm not trans in that way. Um, but my interests were always, you know, more ex expansive in a way and outside kind of normal gender categories. And it's in that way that I, you know, I, 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 I was much more interested in women as friends, though, or girls as friends, though that was very difficult as a, you know, in school um to to pull that off um and uh you know that's just again it, i i always re i always come back to this idea of belonging um sort of where i felt like i fit into the world and that's i think that's a big part to me of of what this subjective experience is a kind of sense of where you fit in and we all no, want to fit in right right um, so when you say that gendered experience um relates to how you feel that you belong or fit into the world does that mean that you're endorsing a view broadly that gender is a social thing yeah i, I do think that um and so i and i think in, in in some ways this is the thing that i find most interesting about this is like i, I spent a lot i spent ages talking to this with one of my graduate students a while ago um is that what I think what makes this so interesting is that there are these two sides. There is the, there is a kind of objective category of, of women and men. And, and here again, we, we need to sort of go, I mean, I'll, I'll do the, in a way, the Foucault thing again, that of course there are biological sexual dimorphism. If there weren't sexual dimorphism of human beings, there would be no women and men. Right. They're just we never would have invented those categories. But you 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 can't understand what women and men are just by looking at biology, because uh, to go back to the kind of old feminist uh, thing about this, gender is the social meaning of sex. That's what 
70s feminists would tell you, right? Gender is, is what sex's social meaning is. And so when somebody identifies as a man or a woman, they're not just identifying with body parts. They're identifying with, in effect, a certain social role that, that is laid out for men and women. And it's not that, it's very difficult to get this right. I mean, it's not that you necessarily think, here's, here's another way to think of it, is that when you, when you identify as a woman, say, it's not that you think you should meet the stereotypes, but you think the stereotypes apply to you. Right, they, you you kind of exper experience them as about you, right? So another here's another. I think all I think all the reactive emotions are interesting in this way. So when Barack Obama was in, was elected president, my black friends were like in tears, right? They were they just were so moved by his becoming president, and they felt a certain kind of pride and something like that that would have been completely inappropriate for me to feel right that I, mean, I can be proud that the united states elected a black president or something but i can't feel what they felt the kind of the idea that one of us right has become the president of the united states and my wife when when kamala harris was inducted as vice president of the united states the same thing happened to her right that it wasn't you know because a woman finally right it was like one of us has become right and it's that sort of one of us feeling that i think is 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 such a and, and it's completely i mean i think one of the things that's striking about it is it's completely um um what's the word i want it's not something you you do consciously right it's, it's just something you feel and it's and so i think it's a it it so there's that side of it, but there's also this kind of complicated social side. And so how do those two things kind of fit together, right? So mm -hmm. when you identify as a woman or a man, you're really identifying with a certain kind of social category or social role that wouldn't exist if it weren't for the society. So, you know, from that point of view, I think the idea that, that, that it's innate or something is, is, is got to go because those social categories just aren't innate. Um, but uh, so, so in the, in the end, I think you're not really going to be able to understand either of these two things without understanding the other thing that you, you don't really understand what women are as a social category, unless you also understand what it is to identify as a woman, to, to experience yourself as of that category. I think that's true for some social categories, probably for race, that's true. Um, but, and maybe not for some others. Um, maybe certain kinds of ethnic categories may not be like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know where to draw that line, but I do think for gender, those two, pe the, both pieces are essential to the full story. Mm -hmm. you, we've talked about how this sense of belonging is really just an un, maybe unanalyzable, uh, just something that you feel. And we also talked uh, in one of our earlier conversations or mentioned that uh, both of us are in therapy. And <laughs> I, I wonder if, I don't know what kind of therapy you're in, but if something like psychoanalysis where you're really trying to analyze everything and maybe the sense of feeling or belonging appears at the conscious level, because you've said it's unconscious, it appears consciously to be unanalyzable. Mm -hmm. But if you really talk about it for a hundred hours and go into all of these memories in great detail mm -hmm. if you might figure out what it really analyzes down to and if that in turn might help put together a philosophical theory of of what this feeling is so uh, i i i actually have um found so as I said, if you look at the philosophical literature, the analytic literature anyway, on this, on gender, it's almost all about the objective category. There are some exceptions, um, but they're pretty few. The objective category um, being The objective sex. category, yeah, of, of gender. So of, of like, what is, it, what is it to be a man or what is it to be a woman? That's the, inter that's the question that Hauslinger is interested in and most people who've written in that, on that stuff. But the, the so I've really struggled to find like, places that people talk about this what i'm calling the subjective experience of oneself the phenomenology 
And yeah, and so by, you know, when you start mentioning things like phenomenology, we start thinking about the continental tradition. And so Butler is good on this. Um, De Beauvoir has some things to say about this. Um, but the place that I've found the most interesting writing on this is in psychoanalysis. Um, uh, people this like Jessica of, Benjamin is really good on this. This might be of interest to you, but uh, yesterday when I was talking to L.A. Paul, she's been working very much on integrating cognitive science with her colleagues at Yale in mm -hmm. metaphysics of first-person mm -hmm. experience. And I wonder if the cognitive scientific literature might uh, lend some insight into the project. It's possible. Um, I haven't seen anything that I that I thought was super helpful. Um, I do think some of the developmental literature is interesting here. Um, children, um, so one of the things that's very striking about, about um, this is actually, this is old. I mean, this, so this, this point comes from uh, Susan Carey's book, Conceptual Change in Early Childhood from the 80s. Um, children do not start out with biological categories related to things like family um, or gender. They're, they're, the, the notions that they have are social notions. So if you ask a child what a mother is, they're going to tell you things about caretaking, right? They're not going to tell, really you, tell you about biology, yeah. right? Of course, right? And, and, and the, but the same goes for like being a boy or a girl. So if you ask a two, uh, not, this is not going to be true for all children, but take, if you take a sort of two and a half year old child and you say to them, hey, look at Timmy over here. Suppose we get, dress Timmy up as a, in a dress and give Timmy some ball, dolls to play with. Is Timmy a boy or a girl? They'll tell you that Timmy's a girl. Right. Huh. Because Timmy's fulfilling the social role of being a girl. And that's how they think about it. Right. Now, those those social notions do survive into adult cognition. So I, th I, I think, for example, that my brother has two children and that they are brother and sister. And that's true, even though they're adopted. Right. So the social notions of parent and brother and sister still exist and we use them all the time and we use them right alongside the, the more biological notions. Um, and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing surprising about that. Uh, but what's what's sort of striking is that the social notions are actually developmentally more basic than the biological notions. They come online, you know, very early in children's experience. And so in a way, you know, it, children, for children, gender is this like incredibly fluid thing. It's, it's, they just, they sort of think of it just as a kind of social role and it, you can kind of flip back and forth like Timmy, you know? Um, and so that, that stuff I think is really, really helpful um, in, in thinking about gender. So one question I have regards the, I don't know, at sometimes inconvenient or problematic ambiguity of the words man and woman so mm -hmm. like earlier for instance you referred to yourself as a man and i'm wondering if i mean did you do this a bit grudgingly or for communicative expedience or was it just reflexive or are you indicating that were you indicating that you belong to the class of male-bodied uh individuals because you've also said that you you don't feel like yeah. a man and don't identify as a man. Yeah, I I, I so I, I do think that the 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 kind of um I think there are a lot of notions here that need to be kind of pulled apart. Um and I think, you know, in cer in certain ways, I mean obviously when I go about the world, other people respond to me as a man. Right. I mean, they call me sir at the grocery store. And that's true. Even if I've got dangly earrings and makeup on and other stuff, they still, you know, call me sir and treat me with the kind of deference that is appropriate to a 58 year old man or whatever. And there's, you know, short of, of really, you know, radical transformation, there's not much I can do to, to change that. So, in some ways, I call my, I, you know, when I refer to myself as a man, it's it's just in recognition of of that and the privileges that that come with it. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, if you ask me about my gender identity, I will I will tell you that I'm 
I'm genderqueer and, um, and, you know, and I flit back and forth between <laughs> two different poles, you know, in, in very unpredictable ways. And, um, you know, but so, so I do, I, and, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of public debates about gender and stuff would be well served by people re- remembering that there are very different categories here that play different roles. There's a really wonderful paper by a woman named Catherine Jenkins responding to Hasslinger, actually, that, that talks some about this, that for different purposes, we may want to use different notions. So, I don't know, sports would be an example. It's not you know, it's not obvious to me that there should be sports for women where woman means the gender identity thing. I mean, maybe there should be sports for female bodied people instead. I have no idea. I don't know. Right. But I don't think we should assume that the same rules that decide which bathroom you get to use are the rules that decide which sport you get to play. Right. That it's not obvious why that should be. Um, and, you know, maybe for some purposes, how somebody self-identifies should be sufficient to to which, you know, which treatment they get or whatever, uh, whereas for other purposes, it shouldn't. I don't know. Um, but I, I think it would help sometimes for people to be a bit more open minded about that kind of question hmm. than than I tend to see. Does it bother you to be called sir at the grocery store or to be, m- m- quote unquote, mispronounced or something like that um yeah. because i imagine I'll, I'll just put a feeling into your mouth yeah it's i can imagine that it is somewhat upsetting to be maybe reminded that the world sees you differently than you see yourself yeah that's that's really insightful actually that's exactly what it feels like um, and so I, I, you know, I, I'm not a person who gets upset with people who mispronoun me. Um, mm-hmm. I do it to myself, right? I've got, fi- I had 50 years of practice of calling myself he, him before I went through this change. And so I, I, I screw up, uh, myself right. sometimes and my wife laughs at me. Um, and so, you know, if my colleagues forget my pronouns, you know, I gently remind them or sometimes I don't even bother. Um, you know, I know people are trying to do their best. It, it, I think when people get upset is when somebody knows damn well how they should be referring to you, how you wish to be referred to, and they refuse to do it. That's mm-hmm. what bothers people because that's just that's just disrespectful and and so forth. And I, I I had a discussion about this with somebody once, and they were like, "What's the big deal?" And I said, "Well, what's your name?" And he said, "My name is Thomas." And I said, "Well, should I so do you want me to start calling you Tommy all the time?" <laughs> and is that, you know, or, you know, mm-hmm. I think up some other nickname for you. I mean, it's just disrespectful, right? I mean, if somebody mm-hmm. wants to be called Thomas, you call them Thomas because they get to decide what name they're called by. And it's, it doesn't seem to me to be complicated, you know? And so right. I think in some ways people make too big a deal out of it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's treat people with respect, you know, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I find the the pronouns very worrisome on one level. I mean, they make me worry a lot. Not that I have any problem whatsoever with using them, but I'm a very conscientious person. And at this point in my life, I really do not like hurting or upsetting people. Mm-hmm. And I actively try to avoid that. But for instance, I, I was talking to Ray Briggs on our podcast episode, and I wanted to talk about how one, wonderful your work was. And mm-hmm. I used the he him pronoun he him pronouns because I just reflexively think mm-hmm. they're male bodied, and right. I immediately felt really bad. Had to pause it. Had to re-record mm-hmm. the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the, uh, while I'm so happy, I'm so happy to use the pronouns. It just causes me a lot of anxiety because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to be uh, making mistakes you know, in that domain. I, I think. I don't want to tell anybody else how to feel, but I do think that people, um, people's intentions mean a lot to me. Okay. So I, I thank you for redoing it, but I, I wasn't going to slap you upside the head if you hadn't mm-hmm. redone it. People make mm-hmm. mistakes, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, I, so I, I, I think, 
I do think that people can get a bit bent out of shape about this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, there are reasons for that. And I understand where people are coming from. It's, it's hard, especially if you really are, you know, trans um, and people mm-hmm. are regularly mis pronoun misgendering you that's it's 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 it gets worse than disrespectful you know it becomes aggressive um and so i understand where that's coming from um but i i don't think it helps the cause so to speak to you know uh put people in the stocks just (laughs) because they once made a mistake you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't think that helps us to do that. Um, I think there's a growing movement among progressive people to to say let's let's stop killing ourselves over this kind of thing, and focus our attentions on the people who are the real problem, um, and you know just catch a grip um, about you know. I, so I don't know if you've seen. I can't, can't remember where this is, but there have been a number of pieces written recently about how difficult it is to get anything done in progressive political organizations now because everyone in the organization spends all their time worrying about the internal politics of the organization and who's being microaggressed against who and blah blah blah, and they're not actually focused on what they're trying to do, and it's really become a huge huge problem. Um, across, I mean, there was a very, I, I, I could look it up, but there was a piece that got huge play uh, just before Christmas, uh, a, a guy from the BLM movement writing about this um, and saying, look, we need to stop doing this because we're, we're not able to focus on what we're supposed to focus on because we're too busy beating each other up over like, you know, relatively trivial things. Mm-hmm. Relatively trivial, let's be clear. So I, I very much like your dangly earrings when you wear them, but maybe it's just because of the graininess, the graininess of the screen when we're recording. <laughs> I didn't know that you wore makeup, which I mean, that's a, that would be, I think, a I'm strange thing to, to yeah. it would be a strange thing to no. bring up just if we weren't already talking about it and in this context. Mm-hmm. But I'm very curious. So why did you start wearing makeup? Um, I started doing it. A- because it's a way of um so this is one of these complicated things where there's this there's this social category out there right that i'm in some way trying to partake of or identify yeah. with yeah and and that's a way a kind of way of it's it, it's both a way of kind of signaling something to people that who's who see me right i mean so when i wear makeup i wear i Eye makeup and lipstick are the two things I wear. I don't wear foundation or anything like that. Um, um, so it both, I think, it, it kind of serves as a signal to people that I'm not, I'm not, I may, I may not be exactly what you think I am. Um, but it's also a way of just kind of, of being, kind of, I don't know, expressing something from within myself or being in touch with something inside myself to to go through mm-hmm. this ritual, right? That that not all women, of course, but many women go through, and increasingly many men, actually, as well. I mean, I think in a, in a younger, you know, your generation, say, I mean, I think there are increasingly many men who wear makeup. Yeah, um, I hear ads and, and for still it all identify the time. as men. Yeah, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it, I mean, George Washington wore makeup. It was totally normal for upper really? class men in seventeen and the seventeen hundreds. All upper class men wore makeup. It was like mm. part of being an upper class man, right? You wore the wig, and you, you know, the whole shebang. They wore makeup. Um, yeah, it's one of those things yeah, you never would have thought, right? Turns out George yeah. Washington wore makeup. Um, but it, yeah, so I mean, I do, you know, and the, the same goes with dress. I mean, I, you know, I, I dress certain ways because I like pretty fabrics and I, I, you know, I like the way they look and, uh, and stuff, but it's also, I dress that way as a way of kind of expressing who I am and trying to, as a kind of signal to people, um, of who, of who I am. Um, and it's, uh, and, and so, you know, I mean, of course, so this is, again, this sort of issue about how the, my own feeling about who I am interacts with the, these kind of social norms that govern gender, that it's very difficult to, um, you know, I certainly don't want to say, oh, it's part of being a woman to wear makeup, but in our culture, in our society in 2022 or three now, right most it's more of a feminine thing to do um and so 
there's nothing in, in innate about it. It's just that's you know by doing that, I kind of partake in something larger than myself. Is the way I think of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's also interesting to me. I I mean I very much like that answer, but hmm, it sort of dissolves there being anything special in particular about the makeup. It's just of like I. I make this podcast one reason because I would like to connect with people, uh, people who are interested in a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And you, you might put on makeup because you want to signal that you want to connect with a certain group. Or I get, I have a dog because I want to connect with dog mm -hmm. people or just, I want to connect with my dog, but it's all mm -hmm. uh, about connection and in a way socially. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, I remember reading this. So when, when Caitlyn Jenner transitioned, um, you know, some years ago, I remember she, she gave an interview in which she said that one of the things that made her so happy was that she could finally wear bright red nail polish without people making fun of her or something, right? And I guess before she transitioned, she had worn nail polish in secret, as you know, many of as I I used to do things like that, you know, in secret because it seemed shameful and and stuff and. Um, and there was a, an article in the uh, New York Times written by, you know, a, one of the, again, sort of trans skeptical person um, saying, um, look, I'm glad that Caitlyn Jenner can wear bright red nail polish. I think everybody should be able to wear bright red nail polish. Wearing bright red nail polish has nothing to do with being a woman. And, and of course that's true, right? Lots of women don't wear nail polish at all. It's perfectly fine if you want to wear nail polish or not. Everyone should get to wear nail polish. But it, it, it kind of, um, it, 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 I think it, what it misunderstood was it was like, it, it assumed that Jenner like had this desire to wear nail polish. Right, it was like completely independent of of any thoughts about gender, and now thank God that she's a woman; she can wear nail polish. Whereas it's actually the other way around. I mean, the reason she wanted to wear nail polish is because that's something that women do in our culture, and it's a way of fitting in as a woman, right? In effect, and if you're a trans person or a gender queer person like me, it's always a struggle. Right, to assert your identity and to insist upon it. And these kind of outward signs are, are effectively ways of doing that. And so I think what was, what, you know, what, that's what this person was missing. It was <laughs> Jenner's desire to wear nail polish was part and parcel of her desire to be a woman, not because all women wear nail polish or anything like that, but just because of, of, of boring social facts, right, about the way that men and women are in our society. And I think that's part of what makes this so difficult, really, is that on the, at, you both simultaneously were trying to kind of transform gender and the social significance of gender and make it a so that you know, men and women have all the same opportunities and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, of course, you have to live in the world that you live in. And given that gender is a social category, its meaning comes from its, you know, the social, socially constituted, we have to live with that. And I, we can't just like dream our way out of that. I mean, so, you know, I, I, I get impatient with people who say, you know, that trans women by, by kind of ex being very feminine or something are kind of reinforcing gender categories. They're just trying to live their lives, you know, in a yeah. world that is very hostile to them and to women. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it by, you know, deciding to wear a dress and makeup is not like the same as raising the flag for the patriarchy. You know, it's, it's just right, trying, that, to, trying to live in the world that you live in. That. I mean, this the past, I mean, 20 minutes of this conversation have given a lot of context to me for uh, my surroundings as a child, because I grew up in Boys Town in Chicago. And mm -hmm. I was always, I mean, you, you would see these like 80 or 90 year old men walking around, or maybe they weren't 90. I don't know how old they were. But in uh, very effeminate dresses just mm -hmm. beneath their butt cheeks uh all sorts of makeup and i couldn't fathom i mean they they must have lost their mind this is what i was thinking mm -hmm. as a little kid but no it makes so much more sense now and is i guess uh i can't help but see it as kind of tragic 
because they lived in a world that yeah. was much different from this world uh, where you're just uh, trying desperately to become part of a group uh, in a mm -hmm. world that kind of won't allow you to be part of that, even though you, you feel yeah. it so deeply. Yeah. I, I, I do. I do wonder sometimes um, whether if I had grown up today, I would be a trans person um, that I, I, I kind of feel too old for that now <laughs> in some ways, you know, my life is established in a certain way and stuff. And I just, you know, I go, but I, I wonder if I had had more opportunities to express those parts of myself when I was younger, whether things would have been different for me. Um, what, what I'm not unhappy, I should say, but you know, I, I do wonder. Maybe I have a terminological question then. So presumably, if you were trans, you would not be a trans woman uh, because you still have, or maybe you, maybe that is what you would want to become. But I'm wondering, is there, is there a term for a trans individual who is androgynous and does not identify as a trans man or a trans woman yeah probably genderqueer i mean there are a lot of terms that get fly that fly around i mean people will sometimes call themselves i knew of someone who called themselves agendered um okay. meaning they were like really didn't identify with either i mean and and, and if you, and you would never you, you would not i mean that's the way they were. I mean, they, you, you couldn't tell whether this was a male bodied person or a female bodied person by looking at them. Um, there are other people who will describe themselves as bi gendered, um, or ambiguously gendered or something. Um, there are native American traditions that have what are third gender categories that they use. Some people have drawn on that Indian culture has a, tr has a category like this. Um, but yeah, what I had in mind was the idea that, that if my, you know, if I had grown up at a different time, then maybe I would have become a trans woman. Um, I certainly thought for a long time that that's where I was headed. Um, but uh, in the end, you know, it's not, not, not where it went for me. But um, that was, uh, that's what I had in mind. So we've, we've been talking a lot about these outward signs that we produce or adopt to uh, signify a desire to become part or that we are part of a group. And I imagine that, well, I don't just imagine, but even when you could not outwardly exhibit these signs, you still felt that you were part of this group, this other group. It was so the, the signs being able to exhibit them wasn't necessary yeah. for you to be, become part of this group. But yeah. this brings me to a, uh, I guess a, a thought experiment that I'm sure I'm not original at all in conceiving of, but not just, I, I want us to envision a situation, not just in which we can't exhibit the outward signs of belonging to a gender group, but even internally, we no longer have mm -hmm. any of the, the signs or attendant biology that indicates we're mm -hmm. male bodied or female bodied. So what I was thinking of, would I still consider myself? Uh, so I, I very much feel like a man. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm heterosexual. I mean, there, there are certain uh, male, traditionally male characteristics like bravery. I don't feel particularly mm -hmm. brave, but I still very much feel like I'm a man. But mm -hmm. if you were able to, in this hypothetical world, transfer my consciousness, my memories, all of these things into an androgynous, asexual, robotic body that was able mm -hmm. to move around the world in all the ways that I'm able to move around the world, but completely incapable of sex or anything like that, mm -hmm. would I still feel like a man? How quickly would that dissolve? Yeah. So I, I do think there are, I think that many feminists uh, have, have dreamed of a world like this, where gender, people really? will say, you know, where gender has no more significance, sorry, where biological sex has no more significance, socially speaking, than eye color does. Um, now, I think we have some precedence for this kind of thing. Um, and I think that comes from now any 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 particular example of this is going to be 
skeptical. I mean, or, I mean going to be open to debate. But um, I think that I, I had a, 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 a colleague who's Jewish, um, and, and actually things are maybe going the wrong direction on this these days. But say a decade ago, we were having a conversation about this kind of thing, and he talked to me about the experience of being Jewish. And he said, look, when I, you know, when I was a kid, so he's, he's retired now. He said, you know, when I was a kid, being Jewish was like a hugely important social identity and not in a good way. Right. I mean, up in, I can't remember. I mean, up until the forties or something, Harvard, like didn't have any Jewish faculty. I can't remember. I can't remember, but there were, you know, Jews were hugely discriminated against in America not to mention other parts of the world in ways that that it, that are almost unfathomable today i mean that you know Jew, being jewish in america today now again given some things that have happened recently may, don't want to speak too soon but it just doesn't have the same kind of significance that it had for for people you know a couple of generations ago and I think that's true of, of lots of ethnic identities. So, you know, Irish people in America were famously called the N-word, uh, you know, 100 years ago and had trouble getting jobs in Boston and stuff, were hugely discriminated against. Now there's, you know, it, nobody cares if, if you're Irish, you know, it's, it's, I'm, you know, it's just, it's just not the same big deal. So... Where, you know, and say being Catholic in America doesn't have the same significance it would have had 100 years ago. When my, even when my parents moved to Alabama when I was three, three months old, my parents moved to Alabama. Um, this was at the height of the Ku Klux Klan, and they were Catholic. And they were really no more popular <laughs> with the Klan than Black people were. And Catholics were you know, if you think about the controversy over John F. Kennedy's uh, nomination for presidency and stuff like that, um, you know, there was tremendous discrimination against Catholics back then and Irish. And so those things change. I mean, so it's not that in the, in these cases, it's not that the social identity has disappeared or anything, but it's that it's taken on just much, much less significance than it used to have. And, you know, I, I do... I do tend to think that it would be, you know, I guess I'm on board with this idea from many feminists that it would be, it would certainly be a much better world if gender, you know, maybe didn't disappear as a social identity, but had tremendously less significance than it does today. So that maybe it would become something that was more optional. So I'm Irish and I'm an American, but I don't really consider myself an Irish American in the way that some people do. You know, I don't, I don't, take great pride in Irish culture, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. But some people do. I mean, they, they really get into their Irish identity and, you know, try to preserve it and pass it down to their children and all kinds of stuff like that. And, you know, but that's something I can choose to do or not to do. Um, and if gender were like that, right, then I think we'd be much better off that, you know, maybe there'd be some people who did sort of take it seriously and other people who didn't, and that would be fine. And everyone kind of, you know, it just wasn't as big a deal as it is nowadays. That's not a direct answer, but it's the best mm -hmm. I can do at the moment. Oh, that's fine. And <clears throat> so recently, I don't know how many years ago it was, but you got your name legally changed. Mm -hmm. and. It was it Kimberly Richard Heck. Heck, and now it's Richard Kimberly Heck. So my middle name was uh, I was I was Richard Gustav Heck Jr. Uh, after my father. Gustav was my grandfather's my paternal grandfather's name. Well, Kimberly um, is so much prettier name. That was the name that my parents had chosen for a girl, um, ah. and so my parents, you know, like many parents back then, didn't know whether they were going to have a boy or a girl. So they had decided on names for boys and girls, and they'd done the same for my, my brothers too. And I I don't rem I remember when I was younger, my mother telling me, you know, that that what my girl name would have been, and she told my brothers too. And they know they also remember what their girl names were, um, but it's a name that's always just meant tremendous amount to me because for all these years, when I kind of yeah. thought of this other part of myself, I would call her Kimberly. Um, that's, and that's some of wonderful. my close girlfriends who call me Kim, um, hmm. it's, 
um, only if only a couple people do that. But it's it's a name. I say it's a name that's just when I was thinking of yeah. like what could I do as a kind of way of marking this change in my life. I sort of hit upon that as I'll oh I'll change I'll I'll include that name as part of my legal name um, and, and also bring these of, two parts of myself together. Yeah, it also kind of uh, signifies a a life that you might have lived in another possible world. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, and so so the Ricky, which you know that, that I go by, is is meant to be a kind of acronym. It's R I from Richard and K I from Kimberly. Mm -hmm. That put it together. Um, that's, Which, and and there's also a there's a trans woman named um, Ricky Wilkins whose writings uh, were very inspirational for me as I was going through all of this, and it's also a kind of tribute to her. And quite figuratively, I mean, the juxtaposition of the ri and the key uh, <clears throat> signifies, I mean, the the blending of the the two. Yeah, yeah, the masculine and the feminine. Feminine. Now, so. It was a very personally meaningful move to change your name. Mm -hmm. Was it also, I'm guessing it was also part of, just like with the with makeup or the fabrics that you choose to wear, part of signifying to other people that you yeah, were changing. That's right. And yeah. then... Yeah, and actually, it's it doesn't work. <laughs> so funny. so that is funny. my wife and I went to a. Huh. Um, so if I if I like so we went to a a, a concert out in in Colorado a few years ago, and I had I I treated as a as a as a binary first name. So if I'm asked for my first name, I say Richard Kimberly. I don't think of it as a middle name, and so I had signed myself up as Richard Kimberly Heck. And when we got there, they thought my wife was Kimberly, right? And that's what always happens is that really? when people see Richard Kimberly, they think that what I've done is to put Richard and Kimberly heck, and right. that my wife is Kimberly. And I have to explain, no, you know, that's Nancy. Mm -hmm. I'm Richard and I'm Kimberly. And eventually they figure it out. Um, but uh, and if I tell them I'm Ricky, they think it's R I C K Y, uh, and they even if I tell them how to spell it, they still write it that way. Um, so there are a lot of these moments where I'm reminded, you know, that I'm I'm really swimming hard against the current here. And then in addition, okay, so we've got two dimensions now. We've got the very personally meaningful dimension. We've got the group signification. Is there also, in a sense, uh, an aesthetic motivation do you like i as a little kid went by robin but mm -hmm. i go by robinson now because i just mm -hmm. like that name much much better i like that i kind mm -hmm. of like that it forces people to use three syllables instead of two <laughs> or, or just, uh, right. little things but is the name kimberly particularly attractive to you something about the the sounds or the way it looks. I like that it has a K and a Y in it. Those are mm -hmm. two very nice letters. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I, I think it's, it's, it's meaning for me has been so long established uh, from mm -hmm. my, you know, it's history that I find it hard to, to even say um, okay. that, that there's something like that. Um, I do. Um, I, I say I, I do like the fact. One one thing I really do like is that I'm the only person with that name. Right? I mean, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, I've even Googled it, and nothing else comes back except for me. Um, that is nice. And so I do like that. Um, I I have occasionally. I mean, it, it's not going to stop that, but I, I do occasionally get mixed up with other Richard Hex, um, including a Nobel Prize winning Richard Heck. Oh. Um, who uh, so I, I got an invitation to give a set of lectures in China once, and it took quite a while before I realized that they thought I was going to lecture on organic chemistry. <laughs> and I had to tell them, not only am I not going to lecture on organic chemistry, but he's dead. <laughs> and they were pretty horrible. And I do philosophy of um, pornography. <laughs> yeah, right. So I don't think you want to be. Thank God we mm -hmm. sorted this out before I got to China. You know? mm -hmm. Um, and they had paid all this money. Um, and, and so we've talked, we talked uh, in our first conversation about some of the hoops you had to jump through and care you had to take in teaching philosophy of sex and pornography. 
uh, at Brown. But how has coming out as gender queer, uh, dressing in these uh, different ways, has it had any impact at all on your professional life or has your professional life impacted it? I think it has had some effect. Um, I um, so I, I've one of the one of the most meaningful things I've done recently professionally actually is to serve on a task force at Brown called the Stat Task Force on the Status of Women Faculty. And our job is to figure out why the percentage of faculty women faculty at Brown has gone down over the last ten years, and make some recommendations as to what to do about this. Um, and I don't I'm. I don't think my gender queerness has like affected my work on the faculty on that task force directly. Um, but one of the things that that we've talked a lot about um, there is the um, what people call emotional labor that that women faculty are often expected to perform. So um, one form this takes, for example, is that students who are having um, um personal or academic difficulties are much more likely to go to female faculty to talk about that than they are to go to male faculty okay? so in effect women faculty end up being the aunties and mothers to graduate to undergraduates um and doing that kind of stuff and it, which can t- consume an enormous amount of time actually mm-hmm. um especially you see this with um women junior faculty especially uh, because they're younger and you know feel feel like kind of big sisters or something it also even for graduate students I, I see in my own department the sort of young young women faculty do a lot of work with the graduate students of this kind and it has been super noticeable how much more of this kind of work I do now than I used to um, because of the huh. way I present um, students are much more I mean it, it just it was it's just like night and day I mean it's I suppose That's it could be attributed to something else, but you know, students just seem much, much more comfortable uh, coming mm-hmm. to talk to me about things, like problems like this, uh, than they did before. Uh, What's interesting they... to Go me ahead. is just that. I mean, if I were at Brown, I could. T- I mean, I can just tell that we would have a, a close personal relationship, but I don't think it would depend on your how you presented outwardly. Mm-hmm. So it surprises me because I'm assuming that. You still had the same. You were still the same person, even if you couldn't yeah. uh, adopt these uh, certain outside signs. So I'm surprised that it just took those to make these relation different sort of relationships happen. Yeah, I think it it is surprising. I mean, I think um, you know one of the things that the cognitive science literature, to mention again, also teaches us is that um, people's reactions to other people um, are deeply affected by how they gender those people. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it, I, I attended a talk some years ago by um, Tamar uh, Zabo Gendler, uh, who's at Yale. Um, and Tamar has done a lot of work on implicit belief and what she calls a leaf and, and things like that. And in this talk, I remember, I remember her saying that, um, there are a lot of things you can do. So if you think about these kind of exper- these uh, implicit bias tests that people to give, where you, you know, um, well, I won't go into the details how they're set up, but they're in- designed to, to to test implicit bias, and there are various things you can do to um, undermine racial implicit bias. So that if you prime people in the right way, you can get them not to respond differently to images of black people and white people. But it turns out there's like almost nothing you can do to affect people's gender response. That that is so, so deeply ingrained, you know, probably for partly biological reasons, um, that you just, you just can't, there's nothing you can do, you know? And so I think it, it's, it's something that's pre-conscious in the way that students are responding to me. Um, it's, it's got not, and, and the other thing, of course, that's striking about this, it has nothing to do with anything that you consciously believe you're, it's, t- it's happening too fast, um, for, for that to matter. And so, 
it's uh, it's 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 kind of what you know what economists or someone would call a natural experiment, right? We kind of ran this experiment and we found out that yeah, it makes a huge difference to how people respond to the, students respond to faculty, like how how they gender you. Um, and to their credit, in a way, I mean, I I I you know the students have been fantastic. I mean, it's it's I I couldn't be you know they are so. You know, it's just it's 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 the generational difference between my generation and their generation is just so striking. I mean, there's nothing weird or unusual about me to them. I mean, I'm different, yeah, but it's it's all one. You know, they're all good, <laughs> and it's it's really it gives me hope. You know that that maybe things will get better. Um, that that they can respond the way they do. And was there anything? So we we've, we've talked a bit about the students, but is there Anything striking about how the philosophical community or the academic community at large has reacted to this or accepted you or not accepted you behind closed doors or anything like that? I've had um I've had no negative experiences. I, I feel super lucky about this. Um That's great. I don't know for for other reasons that I don't really want to get into actually I don't I have not been invited to give a colloquium talk anywhere for several years now um and I I occasionally get invited to conferences but that's by friends um and so I I just don't get invited to do things like that anymore um and I so you know in some ways I I'm going on limited data plus of course there's covid uh, mm-hmm. that's interfered over these last few years. Um, mm-hmm. But at least at Brown um, and in my interactions, the limited interactions that I've had with people in other places in the professional world, um, it's been fine. Um, I've had no, no complaints whatsoever. It's been people, you know, not, I mean, some people are, you know, a bit neutral, but most people have been supportive when, when need be. Um, you know, I've had some people be really very supportive. So, um, getting towards the end of this the, this three part uh, extravaganza mm. on sex, pornography, and gender. Beyond thinking of oneself as a gendered person, beyond consent, what have you personally been thinking or writing about on these topics? of late um so i'm trying to finish up i'm finishing up a paper right now on um so there's this paper i've already published on langton on pornography that's about uh so she she bases her whole account on 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 kind of presupposition and accommodation on austin and also on lewis um so the first paper is about accommodation uh, and the second paper is about presupposition. So I'm trying to finish up this paper. Um, but what it's really about is sort of where it kind of ends up is in these issues about the nature, the ethics of sexual fantasy. Um, and that's the next thing I'd really like to write on. Um, I have another paper that I would like to, to write on. Um, well, actually, the, I mean, this, we, we talked a bit about the ethics of sexual fantasies mm-hmm. on yep. one of our prior podcasts. Yep. But, uh, I mean, it's it's a lot to ask you to remember what we were talking about eight months ago, but do you still, or maybe six months ago, but anyway, do you know if if you have different thoughts on that now, or if you could just summarize what you're thinking? No, it's, 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 more, it's more, unfortunately, I've had very little time to okay. work on it, so I don't think I've moved very far. Um, but I, I, I mostly... I mean, I, there's a there's a bit of a literature on this now, so I I want to try to summarize what's been done up to this point. And I had a student for a class a few years ago write a really good paper on this, in which he like laid out four different excuse me four different kinds of arguments that one might have worries that one might have about about the ethics of sexual fantasy. So I want to try to almost like a survey piece, but to really try to put this issue to bed because. A lot of what's the, the 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 biggest problem is that people will make the distinction between fantasy and desire, um, and they'll recognize that 
someone who fantasizes about a certain thing doesn't necessarily want to do that thing or have any actual attraction to doing that thing or whatever. But then they lose sight of that at some point. Um, and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll like make that distinction and then they'll go on and they'll say, well, but the fantasy must appeal to your desires in some way. And it turns out it's just not true. And there's good empirical evidence that that's not true. So I, mostly I want to bring a lot of empirical stuff to bear on this. Um, on on this sexual issue. fantasies? Yeah. There's a lot of really good empirical work that's been done. Mostly on so, rape fantasies. That's the, that's the one that gets people's people going in the empirical world so here's what my my initial response would be it would be drawing on that adage you can't derive an ought from an is and i imagine that from the empirical literature you're going to get a lot of is and i'm wondering how you or maybe maybe your philosophical purpose isn't to determine what we ought to do with regard to sexual fantasies but that's how i um, conceive of yeah, uh, so the, a general the big, ethical the big empirical uh, thing here is so there was a study done in the 80s so the, the big thing is to try to distinct to, to to really reinforce this distinction between what people fantasize about or what they find erotic in fantasy from what they find erotic in reality that's that's the crucial distinction and there was the study done in the 80s by uh Susan Bond, I think was her name, and a guy in Mosher, I can't remember his first name. Um, and here, so here's what they did. Um, they, they took a bunch of uh, female undergraduates and they asked them to imagine the, imagine the following situation, that they were in the campus library. I think this was done at Yale, actually. Anyway, they were in the campus library late at night and they leave the library and they see this like guy lurking by the door who follows them out of the library and then assaults them and rapes them. Okay. And they ask the women to imagine this happening to them, but they set it up, before, you know, as they were setting up the situation, they either presented it as a sexual fantasy or they presented it as like, I want you to imagine this really happening to you. Okay? And what they found, unsurprisingly, is that the women who were asked to imagine this as a sexual fantasy were much more likely to be, well, they were likely to become at least moderately sexually aroused by thinking about this. And they experienced very few, ne fewer negative emotions and more positive emotions than the women who were asked to imagine this really happening to them, who did not become sexually aroused and generally tended to find the whole thing unpleasant, unsurprisingly. Okay? And so the, the significance of the study is just that it, and, and they, they also asked women before the study, like, do you have fantasies about being raped and stuff like that? And they correlated that with some of the results. And so what the study shows is just that this might should, maybe should have been obvious anyway. It's like, oh, we did a study and found out that people like ice cream. It's is that there's all the difference in the world between a sexual fantasy about something like this and even imagining it, but imagining it in a way that's realistic and not sexual a fantasy so there's a question about here a good question here about like what what exactly is sexual fantasy and how is it different from just imagining something and i think you know there's a lot of good work to be done trying to answer that question but the thing i'm really looking for is just this idea that they're that fantasizing about something isn't is very different from imagining it i mean it, it, imagining it's part of it but it's it's not the same as imagining something in a realistic way and so being aroused by a fantasy of rape is not the same as being aroused by the idea of rape or something like that. Um, so in, in this paper, really otherwise very interesting paper by a guy named John Corvino, who's, there's all kinds of wonderful things about him, um, called Naughty Fantasies. He says, he's talking about this at one point, and he says, well, maybe people who fantasize about rape would be even more aroused by real stories about rape. And the answer is, they're not, actually, right? I mean, huh. and if somebody was, that would be deeply worrying, right? That's but in fact, people aren't. That's just not how it happens, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so, and but it seems like, but the way he puts it is like, but of course they would be, right? It'd be even better. And but it's not. People don't find it better. They find it hor They find it just as horrifying as anybody else finds it, right? Does he Fantasy is its own an, special thing. An explanation for does he provide an explanation for that or a hypothesis? No, he he's not aware of it. I mean, he okay. he just sort of seems to. So he, the point he makes, and what makes this so hard to 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 pin down, right, is that he says. It's not that you're fan it's not that you're aroused by the fantasy of rape, right? And like the like the the fantasy object itself is what's arousing, right? It's the content of the fantasy that's arousing. But he takes that to an effect mean that it's being a fantasy is irrelevant, right? Because what's arousing is the rape part. And the rape part will be arousing whether it's a fantasy or a real thing or or anything, right? But it turn but it, it's just not it's just not true that, that, that that's how it is. It's 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 only arousing when it's in a certain context. In effect, um, outside that context, it's just as horrifying as you know people find it horrifying, right? So that's that's the key distinction that I want, um, and and it's it's a distinction that's made, been made over and over and over again by people. But I think it's particularly striking the way that they did this. Um, that you. Um, I mean, it should be said, social psychology is weird. Sometimes the experiments don't turn out the way you expected them to. Um, mm -hmm. I think one I remember from being in college was that if you pay people $1 to do a terribly boring task, they get more enthusiastic about it than if you pay them $20. <laughs> right? Because they weird. have to like tell themselves some story about it. Like, to justify their having wasted this time on this boring task, right? Whereas if you pay them enough money, they just say, oh, well, it was boring, but I got paid. If it, if they didn't really get paid, then they have to tell themselves a story. So that's the sort psychology of, can be surprising. You know? Yeah, that's the sort of study where you, you just wonder, it's so strange, like, is this going to replicate? <laughs> Yeah, and it had. It turns out it's yeah. It's social psychology. It's, I say social psychology is weird. So you never want to take mm -hmm. anything for granted uh, in these areas. Um, well, it's, it must be very fun for you that you get to do so much research in areas outside of philosophy for the things that you're writing on. Yeah, hmm. I I really do. Um, it's 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 as you can see, I, I'm really passionate about this stuff, and I yeah, I yeah, find yeah. it fascinating and interesting and i think you know human sexuality is just um you know i've always just been really amazed by it, by it the, the, the its capacity to change people and to transform people and for for deep connection between people i mean that's kind of what i'm really interested in is the the way in which sex can be an avenue for this connection between people and it's just tragic that it still so harms so many people too um, when mm -hmm. it has this powerful positive potential. Um, that's, that's, I don't know, that's the mess that I'm kind of trying to sort out. Beyond the response to Langton and then the ethics of sexual fantasies, are there other projects on the docket for you yeah there's a paper i want to write on uh i think we talked about this before too about the the, the question whether porn can be art um it's really a yeah, paper about, about, that. about the aesthetics about the aesthetics of pornography mm -hmm. and um i want to talk in that paper some about the beauty of sex um i, I think I, there are certain films i know that uh just i think it's almost like a you know think of like great landscape photography or something you know it's like this beautiful landscape and somebody has captured it in a photo and i think mm -hmm. there are certain films where it's just like what's happening between these two people is beautiful and the film captures it you know and there are different ways to capture it right that highlight different things that are going on between them that and the real challenge is to kind of capture uh, Andy, Angie Roundtree, who I've had come speak to my class. I think I mentioned before, she talks about a lot of this a lot that, that in her, when she shoots sex, what she's trying to do is to capture the feelings that these people have for each other. That's what she's trying to capture in her films. And when she, when it succeeds, it's amazing. Um, and so I, you know, I want to try to talk, but you don't, you don't see people talk about this in the literature because you have to talk about 
actual films to pull it off. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think I think there are a lot of different angles about about the aesthetic experience of watching pornography that I'd like to try to bring out. Um, that that's up there. Uh, but the that and the other thing I've got going. And this I, this actually probably postdates our last conversation. So this, I have the student Rachel Ledham that I mentioned before, um, and she finished her dissertation in the end of the summer. Yay! And it was fantastic. Um, and she and I are going to jointly turn it into a book. Um, oh, that's wonderful! That's uh, on great. sexual on on consent and stuff like that. So hopefully that's going to start this summer. I have a I'm going to hire a couple of undergraduate research assistants to help me plow through some of the literature. Um, and then hopefully we're going to get started on that this summer. Oh, that that's very cool. Have you, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. With regard to the ethics of pornography, I mean, sorry, not ethics, aesthetics. Mm-hmm. I talked to CT Wynn at the university of Utah about aesthetics in particularly in particular, one thing we discussed was arts of object versus arts of action and mm-hmm. whether or not things like rock climbing could be considered an art and mm-hmm. what the aesthetics of that are. And I see very much parallels there in the same mm-hmm. way that uh, sex is in a way it's a struggle. It's uh, it certainly involves a skill in some cases but even mm-hmm. clumsiness can be beautiful in in mm-hmm. some way so there's there's so much there to talk about yeah part of the part of the difficulty here is that i i so as i've uh, as i've gotten into all this stuff i've become aware as you say a of how many how it sort of expands right into so many other areas of philosophy that i know nothing about so i've got a book over here somewhere about the aesthetics of film that i i need to read uh-huh. Um, and I picked up bits and pieces from that. Um, and I have, you know, people I can talk to about these kinds of things. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm really super aware of, you know, how little I really know about aesthetics, um, and, um, and film, you know, <laughs> and things. And so it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, it's ta- it's definitely been a kind of humbling experience in some ways. Um, but I think I've said before, I mean, one of the things I really love about philosophy is that you can do what I'm doing. I mean, you can you can decide to do something new and completely new, and it's possible. Um, and I'm not the only one who's done, you know, Jason Stanley would be another example. I mean, Jason's early career was all in epistemology and philosophy of language. And now he writes about propaganda and poli- you know, political theory. Um, and... Gideon Rosen made a similar transformation. Dave Donald Davidson is a famous example, right? Davidson's dissertation was on Plato. Um, Tim mm-hmm. Scanlon's dissertation was on logic. You know, so it's it's one of the things I say I love about philosophy. It, it it's still for all its for all the ways in which it's specialized, it still is a kind of unified thing, and different parts of it touch other parts of it, and you can kind of move around and follow your. Your your inner cure, you know, your inner child is just mm-hmm. why, 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 right? You can mm-hmm. still do that as a philosopher. I don't think I could put words without thinking about it to exactly what I have in mind, but there is something in philosophical training and about philosophers that very much prepares you to find questions and interesting ways of looking at and the proper ways of treating problems Mm -hmm. in a wide variety of disciplines that aren't available to the practitioners of those disciplines themselves without having undergone the philosophical training uh, and experience. So that is, I mean, it's it's a really great part about philosophy and one of the reasons why I decided to go into it uh, so that I could uh, sort of satiate my desires in all these wide areas. I, uh, you know, I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about non-philosophical careers for graduate students because many of our graduate students go into non-philosophical careers, and we've been asked repeatedly by the administration, you know, are the are, are is what you're doing for them helping them in their careers, even though they haven't become philosophers. And I think the answer to that question is in a lot of what you just said, that philosophy 
philosophical training teaches you how to uncover interesting questions and how to find ways to address them. I mean, I, the way the, my standard joke about this is that if you can think clearly about the mind body problem, you can think clearly about anything, you know, because <laughs> that's about as confusing as it comes. And, you know, if you can sort of see your way through something like that, I mean, there's a certain kind of practical training of just like, what do you do when you're confused? You know, it, when do you, what do you do when you can't figure something out? You know, that's that's what philosophy teaches. And I think lots of lots of businesses actually have found, I think, you know, that that philosophers are good at this. We're, we're you know, we te- we do we do teach people to do this, and these kind of problems do pop up, and philosophers are good at solving them. Um, and that's why our students are attractive to to businesses. Um, I have a student right now, a former student is working for Steve Cohen, for example, the owner of the Mets, <laughs> and, oh, wow. uh, you know, and, and doing very well, you know, and making and a lot says more all money the than time. they would. Make, yeah. At a, I mean, at a so maybe if he gets department. really rich, he can donate something to the department, <laughs> establish yeah, a chair. Be great. Um, but yeah, he's, he talks all the time about how important his philosophical training is to what he does. You know, really great, great human being, by the way. So mm. kept, kept, kept in close touch with him. Um, so, you know, I, th- I do think philosophy is, is more practical than people give it credit for sometimes, just in a very abstract way. So I gestured toward one earlier, um, though it probably wasn't coherent enough to, to talk much about on the spot. But something we haven't discussed much in our conversations are the role of thought experiments in mm-hmm the philosophical literature or any literature really on on sex and pornography and gender Mm -hmm. so uh, are there any particularly interesting ones that oh gosh um thought experiments not really i don't think i don't think not in the same way that you know say think of the trolley problem or Frey's yeah, yeah. morning story me start thinking or something like that. No, I, I don't I not that I can think of. I mean people use examples, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and stuff, but I I I don't think thought experiments play quite the same role. I mean the one the one place that you do sometimes see people do this, and I actually um have, have done this myself a couple of times, is to take uh, I mean, people will often to talk about like what happens if you switch the genders in some particular case. So um, there's this really wonderful paper that I kind of start the philosophy of sex class with by a woman named Heather Corinna, where she tells this story about uh, about a, a young, a teenage boy and girl who are having sex for the first time. And and she tells, you know, tells the story and has a bunch to say about it. But she says toward the end of the paper, like, what if we flip the genders in the original story? Like, what would that look like? And I, I did it. You know, I just sort of copied and pasted it, and switched all the genders, and had my students read it. And you see people do that kind of thing a lot as a kind of thought experiment. Um, but that's that's probably about as close as it comes. I think I can't I'm trying to I can't think of anything else. Um, there's just not. It's it's yeah. I can't think of anything else. I wonder if there's a reason for that. Like maybe our discussions of sex, gender, and pornography are so very much rooted in the here and now and the particulars. Uh, The empirical studies are so relevant that it just isn't that interesting or useful for philosophers to come up with abstract situations or not abstract situations, but I think maybe, uh, maybe I think it might be just that the sort of most of the abstract situations you can think up with are realized. right? So, so yeah. you don't you kind of don't have to think them up because um, they're all out there anyway. Um, Foot fetish and, pornography, yeah. uh, the rule of the, the yeah, what is, I mean, is it rule 43? Of the internet? Rule, rule, rule 40, rule 34, I think. Yeah. 34. There's a, apparently there's a subreddit devoted. I just run into this the other day or devoted to oh, rule God. 34. Well, that's fodder for a lot of papers. <laughs> um, yeah um and then okay well lastly and then i think we can close for the moment the the sex discussion is are there any topics that we haven't touched on to your knowledge or to your recollection in our conversations about sex gender 
pornography that you find particularly worth discussing? Um, no, I, you know, I think we've hit on most of the stuff that that has been of interest to me. Um, okay, great. I do think, I mean, I, I, I do think I, I, there's a lot going on now. Um, you know, I think we talked about this once before. I mean, I think more and more people are coming out of grad school now who are interested in these kinds of issues. And that's, I think, partly due to Langton's influence and Hasslinger um, and, and, and Jenny Saul and, you know, some of these really visible feminist philosophers, uh, Louise Anthony would be another person. Um, and, you know, so I'm excited about it. I think, I think there's, I think we're going to see a lot of progress over the next 10 to 20 years as, as people, especially women, you know, who, who I think bring a, an important perspective on, on these kinds of issues um, that, that, it, you know, it's really mostly women who are doing this work now. Um, but there are some men who who are who are doing good work. Sam Director is a good example of a guy who's doing good work on his Tom Doherty. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm excited. I think it's I've got a lot of undergrads who are fat, who are interested in this. I have a student, a former student, who's now at Michigan, who's working on this kind of stuff. Who's doing fantastic work, Margot Witta. Um, so I, I I I hope you know people who are watching will. At least, you know, if they're not going to get into this for themselves, we'll start to pay, just pay attention to what's going on because it's really, really good stuff that's being done these days. Well, my what really stood out for me, what I enjoyed most in this conversation was was talking about you and uh, oh. your experience with the with um, gender identity. So, if it's okay with you, I'd like to. Sw- move away from philosophy. I, mean, I think maybe sure. maybe somehow philosophy will find its its way back in, but I'd like to talk more about you and some of the things that you're very okay. interested in. So I know mm-hmm. that you're an audiophile. You're really into mm-hmm. high-end audio. Can you tell There's me a bit a about wall of records back there, for example? Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, so do you, did you yeah. build your own audio system? Is that, I have built some stuff actually. Okay. Um, most of my main system is stuff I bought. Um, I built it, you know, I put it together over, I got, I started getting into this right when I graduated from, I, I was always into music. So I had a, I had a stereo system of my own as a teenager, uh, which was pretty cheap, but it was okay. And as I, when I, when I finished college, when I finished graduate school and I got my job at Harvard, I, my present to myself was some really good stereo equipment. How so much did, went, did the did it cost? Um, at that time, I think the speakers were about nine hundred dollars, and the amp was probably about four hundred dollars. And I already had a I already had a turntable that was decent and a and a preamp that I, something I could use as a preamp. Um, and I, so I bought a pair of Bowers and Wilkins B and W these British British made speakers and an Adcom amplifier. Um, and that that was this kind of start of it. And then over the years, I just you know, when you have all these kind of separate pieces, you can upgrade each one successively. So I would make the amp a little better and then I would make the speakers a little better. And now, I mean, the system that we have in the, in our family room is, is phenomenally good. I mean, it's just, I, <laughs> it's unbelievable how, how good the music sounds, um, especially when you put on a really, really well-made record. Um, and the, uh, just, just in the last couple months, a company named analog productions has been reissuing the Staley Dan catalog. I don't know if you're in <laughs> who Staley Dan was, I know um, but they were, a, yeah. So they're doing the, each album successively and they're producing them from the original master tapes. They're doing them at 45 RPM instead of 33, which gives you more frequency range. They're being pressed on this like absolutely gorgeous vinyl. <laughs> um it's like almost as clear as glass and it's they're 150 bucks a piece so they're not cheap wow. they're the That's they're the cool. black the black things on the bottom there but you know when That's i put one cool. of those on it's like the band is in the room i mean it's just it's unbelievable how transparent it is it's like you know it's like you could be sitting in the studio with them and that's the experience that i'm looking for is the the you know i i listen to music for the emotional power of it and the beauty yeah, of yeah. it and so the, the the closer i can get to the to, to being there you know and hearing it the way it was 
when they when they performed it. That's what yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Um, what you're describing definitely sounds very transcendental. So it's a it's a huge difference from what you'd be oh, yeah. hearing over like the headphones you're wearing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually one of the things I built uh, was a headphone amplifier um, because during the pandemic cool. I listened to a lot of headphones because I was home a lot. Um, I still am, I guess. And um, I have a you know very ended up buying a really a three thousand dollar pair of headphones and they're pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but it's, what's yeah, the I, brand? I, uh, they're called it's called Focal uh, F O C A L. They're the Focal Utopias uh, is the is Focal the model. Utopia. Yeah, they're really good. Um, and the the, the headphone cool. amp that I built is a uh, wow. It was designed by a guy from uh, named Wade, Wayne Colburn, um, who just is a genius. Uh, and it's very easy to build. I mean, I'm not. I don't know anything about electronics. I know how to use a soldering iron. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's I could build it, and it's it sounds. I've actually built four of them now. I sent one to an audio to this audiophile friend of mine robert may in california i sent it to him as a present i sent another one to another friend of mine then he had a guy come over to his house and listen to it he was like where the hell can i get one of these things and so i built one for him too um and yeah it's it's fun it's 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 great it's just great fun to take a pile of parts and turn them into something that sounds beautiful Mm -hmm. have you heard of deviolet i'm sure you have or like the phantom deviolet the deviolet phantom it's a speaker oh yeah yeah sure yeah yeah i once upon a time had a couple of those and by themselves they sounded phenomenal though i don't i don't think it's probably anywhere near the level of your speaker but one of the selling points of them is that they're supposed to sync up very well over bluetooth and play Mm -hmm. at the same time but that mm-hmm. never worked and it was an absolute nightmare. So I ended up selling them. Yeah. But how much, how much does like a top of the line speaker system cost? Uh, um, well, you can spend as much as you want. I mean, if you want to spend $500,000 on a pair of speakers or somebody prepared to sell them to you. Um, but I Would think, they have to be know, custom made. Um, I think there are speakers. There are, there are speakers that are not custom made that go up to at least a quarter million. Um, now the law of diminishing returns kicked in way, way before we got to there. Um, oh yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, I think you can, you can get a very, very good sounding pair of speakers for five or $600. Um, oh, really? to get a like, you know, really world-class pair of speakers, you probably need to spend 10 times that at least. Um, okay. the speakers we have now listed for 14,000, um, I paid seven for them used. Um, they weigh 125 pounds a piece. <laughs> oh, wow. huge. Do you listen um, very loud, or they're great at all? No, levels? I, I, they're they're great. Yeah, that's one of the things that that's great about these. They're they they you know, I mean, you need to get a certain level of volume in order to to get things moving. Um, but mm-hmm. they're they're I have bad ringing in my ears, so I oh, t- generally all the time? not to all the time. Yeah, yeah, oh, all interesting. the time. And did, actually, that, I, did that come from something? Probably listening to too much loud music <laughs> when I was I a see. kid. Though it it's gotten worse with these post COVID symptoms, and that's a that's a known thing. Um, yeah. It's okay. it's it's a symptom. Um, so I tend not to listen mm-hmm. that super loud, um, and I will always wear earplugs when I go to concerts and stuff. Um, and the but, the en- enjoyment though of building things, building speakers, I imagine also is what fuels your interest in woodwork <laughs> right it, it yeah they kind of came together in a weird way i re- i originally got interested in woodworking because i was tired of spending huge amounts of money on bookcases and i figured surely i can make bookcases that are nice for a lot less than i'd have to pay for you know nice bookcases so actually most of those are bought but that's that's <laughs> where i got started and then it kind of took off from there and especially over the pandemic when I, you know, wasn't doing anything. I just started building all kinds of stuff, um, boxes and frames. And now I've redone our kitchen and oh wow, um, all kinds of okay. stuff. Yeah. The kitchen's beautiful. Actually, I'll, I'll send you some pictures. Yeah, send me a picture. It's, I, it's, cool. it, it's, it's really, it's, that was a huge project and actually it's not done yet. It's still in progress because Do you have I'm a big like, work shed. With all I use the of half of our garage. 
um, okay. which means I have to shut it down in the winter time because it's too cold. Um, mm. But I, we have a we have a big two car garage, and I can use one side of it. Um, my my wife's car is in the outside. Um, but uh, yeah, but it's it's pretty well appointed now. I mean, again, I've kind of built it up over time, but I have some pretty good you know stuff enough stuff to be able to do big projects like that. Okay, well, the last of your hobbies that I'm aware of is you're very into Linux or Linux or... Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. it Linux? Linux, yeah. Okay. I think. I might be. I think it, I've heard people pronounce it different ways. I mean, it's named what? after Linus Torvalds. What is Linux for those who... So Linux is an operating system. It's equivalent to Windows, say, on a PC. Um, it just... it it. You know, it, it provides you with the interface that you need to, to interact with the computer. And it's it's what's distinctive about it is that it's it's uh, it's so-called free and open source. So anybody can contribute to it. Anybody can change it. Anybody can modify it in ways they want. And I've gotten into uh, working and starting about 2005, I started working on an open source project called Lix, which is a um, kind of like a word processor uh, in a way. Um, but it's specifically designed to be a kind of user-friendly interface to a typesetting system called LaTeX. And I, uh, I mean, it, I'll tell you how powerful LaTeX is. I mean, I, I wrote my first two books in Lix, and I printed a PDF from them, and that's the book. I mean, the book is literally printed from a PDF that I sent to Oxford University Press. And mm -hmm. the LaTeX is that powerful. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's what most it's, publishers it's use to do their mm -hmm. own typesetting. Um, it's uh, so, so Lix, but writing LaTeX is like writing programming language. I mean, it's like, I, I remember many years ago, a student, a, a fellow student asked George Bulos why he didn't write his papers in LaTeX because they were, it's, it's designed for scientific writing. And George said, there's enough code in my papers without my having to write my papers in code. And writing LaTeX is like writing code. And mm -hmm. so Lix looks more like a normal word processor. You don't have to, it kind of hides the complexities of LaTeX from you until you need them, and then they're available to you. Um, and I've, I've worked pretty extensively on that over the years. I've kind of wound down a bit over the last few years, as my colleagues on the Lix development team would tell you. Um, but I still tinker with it. And I'm actually, today I will be releasing version 2.3.7. Um, okay. Of the program. Um, Everybody it's listen time up. Time to do that. Yeah. Um, so if you're if you use Lix, you can get the new version out in just a couple of days. Um, but what what appeals to you about Linux when you could be using Windows? Or I mean, my Mac yeah. seems to be not problematic for me. I, so I started using it many years ago um, when I started when I was having serious problems with Windows. Actually, I, I just got frustrated with Windows. And I'm one of those people who's never satisfied with anything the way it is. I want to be able to tinker with it. I want to take it apart and figure out how it works and put it back together. And that's what appeals to me. You know, that I can I see. Okay. I, I obviously I can't I'm not I'm not a good enough programmer to work on the what's called the Linux kernel. That's way beyond my capacities. But you know, even if I'm driving my car around and I I'd like push a button i'm like oh, this button should do that instead you know <laughs> or i should be able to do this you know that's that's the kind of person i am and so that's how i got into programming licks i was like using it and i was like i wish it did this and i so i wrote to somebody and they were like well you could make it do that okay you know <laughs> i guess i'll make it do that um and i taught myself enough programming to to be able to do it well one immediate question i have though is i mean on my apple i'm getting updates all the time from apple mm -hmm. for security updates and things like that if yeah linux is open source in this way how do they manage to or yeah how is it managed to be kept secure so the the open source part is actually an, an important part of the security um actually one thing so linux and os x the apple operating system are both built on top of are both variants of what's called unix which is an old older operating system and it one of the core advantages to unix is that it is from the ground up it was designed as a multi-user operating system so it 
it, it's it's designed to kind of insulate what this person is doing from what that person is doing, and so to keep this person from screwing up other stuff, right? So it's it's in, it's in a way inherently more secure than 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 Windows is, but the fact that the programs that anybody can go in and look at the program just um, I, there's a saying, I can't remember who said this uh, in the programming world, that given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And what that means is if you got enough people to look at it, somebody's going to figure it out. So if you've just got all these people who can kind of look at the program and plow through it, you're much more likely to catch problems than you are if there's only some little tiny group of people who are allowed to, you know, to, to see the program. And so I get security updates literally every day uh, for yeah. for uh, different you know different things because it's just it's a huge community of people who are working on it. Things are constantly being updated and released. You don't have to wait for. I mean, there are depending on your so-called distribution, there will be major updates that happen every once in a while. But security updates are an absolutely continuous process. I imagine, though, you're also then at the risk of one of those people being a bad actor. And yeah, though, on a bug they with, would. Um, any any pro any um serious uh, open source project is going to have uh, what they call code review practices. So nobody is going to make a, a big change on their own. Um, everybody's you know there's always somebody else looking over their shoulder. That's as true on the Lix team. So every change that anybody makes goes out by email to the entire team, and everybody else is then look well. I don't always do it, but you know, you look at it and say, "Does this make sense?" You know, mm -hmm. and getting the right to make changes is itself a long process. Um, not ever, not you know, I can send a patch to whoever I want to, but I can't commit changes to anything else. Uh, if I if take, you know, if I wanted to, I could become a developer and get commit rights, but in order to do that, I have to prove my bona fides first. Okay, Ricky. Well, I know that, well, you know that my intention was for this to be the groundbreaking first episode in podcast history where uh, for an hour, maybe we talk about philosophy of sex yeah. and we go straight into the sense, uh, and reference. sense reference and, yeah. and Frega. But right. I don't think that today is the day for that day, two and a half hours in, and I've got a yeah. doctor's appointment pretty soon. Uh, but uh, this was great. It was a, a great cap, I think, on our last two episodes. Uh, and I'm already looking forward, though, to delving into some of the air, other areas of Yeah, I've had a lot expertise. of fun again. So okay, thanks, thanks very much. Awesome.